What's going on, Spit and Chicklets fans? Biz here, and we are going to be in Detroit, Michigan, August 6th and 7th at Greek Town Casino. We're going to set up the ball hockey courts. We're going to be playing some roller hockey. And even if you didn't get accepted to play in the tournament, you can still show up and party with us. We're even going to have a little uh, post game party at where with? Old Shillelagh's in Detroit. It'll be a time and a half. Come for the hockey, stay for the Pink Whitney. Let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 345 of Spittin' Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney. For my friends at New Amsterdam Barker here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family, what is up all very, very busy week in the NHL? Two drafts, bunch of signings, trades, buyouts, retirements, the Kraken are finally coming together. But let's check in with the boys first. Producer Mikey Grinelli, are you in New York City right now, buddy? Uh, I am in New York City, but I got to spend the week at Lake Winnipesaki, beautiful Ooh. lake in New Hampshire. My parents just got a place up there. Congrats to them. Oh, I'm a deal. huge boat guy, so we spent the whole day Saturday on the boat, got to watch the draft there Friday night. It's a much-needed family time. It was nice, though, boys. Fucking making that Skrilla. I got the lake house. <laughs> Look at you guys. The Grinellis are raking it in from, what, the greatest bar? The greatest bar. The greatest bar doesn't make a dime, but, uh, yeah, nice. Good to hear. works hard. Can't, can't Not a big deal. Can't beat New Hampshire Lakes this time of year. I was just up one myself in New Hampshire, but let's go to Biz Nasty, Paul Bissonette. You're not at your usual homestead right now. Doesn't look like it. I'm in uh, LA. I love LA. California. We love love. It. I was what a just weird the naked gun. What a weird 24 hours. So I'm doing uh, I'm doing something here with a hockey player. Can't mention who. A little special uh thing, but uh I saw a guy take a shit on the sidewalk today. Uh, I went out for dinner last night. The 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 waiter accidentally gave my credit card because well, I was sitting at the bar. He gave it to somebody else. They signed out of their tab. So uh, I was waiting. Hopefully they would return it. Today they went and treated themselves to lunch with my credit card. So I finally had to cancel it. And what else has happened? Oh, so right do you think, my- sorry, do you think they knew it was like yours no. this afternoon or you think they're just like thinking it's there still? No, I, I'm assuming they also have like a blue credit card and they haven't thought twice about it. And I mean, I think that if you're going to, you know, if he knew, we probably would have went and made a, a more expensive purchase than eating at this restaurant and charging 30 bucks this afternoon. So hopefully he fucking recognizes at some point, but uh, I guess nothing you can do now. I just don't want to have to cancel it. And now I got to like reach out to all these people that oh, I paid. Those- so, I know. I know. I just ruined your day. <laughs> Buddy, even thinking about having to get a new card and then registering the card with every fucking app and every yeah. website, your yeah, online shop and all that kicking the dick action. I'm happy for you that it's coming home home baby yeah what do you what do you mean coming home again are you are you getting the card back no no i had to call and do you have to do all that stuff yeah yeah i know how did we not cancel this podcast dude (laughs) that is the biggest The, the littlest news. shit rattles you, and the only reason I wanted to actually tell the story was was to upset you. So oh. Wit's gonna have the worst podcast going, and it's gonna be a long one because we got a lot of shit to talk about. I guess the only other crazy thing I saw in the twenty four hours I've been here, so there was this massive lineup in West Hollywood, and uh, I was assuming there was like a, like a merch drop or something clothing related. No, there's this there was this food truck that they sell coffee. 90 minute wait to get a cup of coffee with 90 fucking minutes. I took a video of it. Coffee like, well, that's the thing. I went up to the hand job. I went, (laughs) I went, it's got, uh, it's got Columbia special in it. It was RA's food truck. Um, No, but I went up to the front and people were like taking pictures with the plastic cup that they had it in, not a special cup. And I said, it was it worth the way. And the girl was like, no, not really. And Bit. all these, all these like teeny bopper TikTokers are just line up to drink this coffee. So this world has gone absolutely mad. And uh, but I tell you what, it was a good day shooting uh, with uh, my friend, former uh, or not former, current NHL player. And I have to leave it at that because I can't spill the beans. But uh, we also, what's that? I was just say maybe the guy in that video still is the one who got your card, and then he bought a coffee with your card, and that's why you saw a video of him taking a shit on the <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, mean, well, you kind of skipped over that. So some guys just standing there, drops his draws, and just takes an absolute smash on the. Yeah, sidewalk. yeah. Um, oh, he sent the video to our group. I, I thought it was oh. random. I didn't know you took the fucking thing. You no, no, I, I took it. I was like, I caught. I, I mean, <laughs> it's De- deuce in the wild. I just because you know when you tell someone that you saw that, you know they might not believe you. It's like, no, nope, yeah, a guy legit just dropped. A oh douche. my god! I'll take your <laughs> <laughs> Next time, <laughs> I was. Oh, the... dude, <laughs> he actually. <laughs> Oh, he looks like like a normal human. He's like dressed, he's not dressed like a homeless guy. No, no, he, that's that's the craziest part about it. He had like a nice shirt on with a nice pair of jeans. And yeah, 
Yeah. What just, the? I, f- I think that's. I think it's becoming so common where people like. Yeah, people just drop their drawers Skip. and t- take a massive shit on the street. But yeah, this is like West Hollywood, just a different type of place. And uh, and I've got to experience quite a few things in the last 24 hours. Now, there was one other thing I was going to mention, but you cut me off there, R.A., with, with your theory that the guy who stole my credit card was the one taking a shit in front of me. <laughs> Not a bad theory. And he <laughs> got the coffee he mentioned. Yeah. So I, tried to, I tried to tie it all together there. For me. Oh, is that what you're trying to do, R.A.? I guess. Yeah, maybe the coffee is what caused them to shit. <laughs> There I think go. that we're, was the joke. T- oh, okay. Fucking Jesus. <laughs> over my head. I don't know how that got over. Oh, you know what I was going to mention was that's not the only content we captured in the last couple of weeks. We uh, ended up having that, uh, the, the battle of the grill for Budweiser oh, come yep. out. Me and Wit went head to head in a barbecuing competition. And I tell you what, I'm going to hand it over back to you to intro Wit to talk about the most captivating part of that video. Last but not least, the Wit dog, Ryan Whitney. What's new with you, brother? Not much, guys. It's great to be on. And like Biz said, I mean, I don't ever remember this much stuff happening in the NHL, like in the month of July. It just seems crazy. Now, granted, it's an expansion draft involved, but it's news galore daily by the minute, by the hour. So I'm excited to chat. Getting to the video. Check it out. Budweiser uh, sponsored me and grilled me and Biz doing a little grill off. It was a blast to do. I won, obviously. I'm really getting better on the grill. I'm very happy it showed on the video too. I, I think I, I really presented that me that meal with a little flair for you, and I and I won. Not that I didn't mention that. The biggest <laughs> issue being how the fuck Ra holds a fork. If you have ever even seen somebody hold a fork like this, you probably never eat again because man. Is- Disgusting. It's not a caveman would be like, what are you doing, man? I don't know how you hold it like that? Because a caveman might hold it like, you know, like caveman style. It's bad explanation. But you know what I'm talking about? I'm showing these guys right now. We're just full fist around a spoon fo- or a fork. R.A. goes between the middle and the index finger. So if you see me on YouTube, he's basically like uh, how you would put keys in between your knuckles if you wanted to punch someone and get them with the key. And then he's bringing the chicken up into his mouth and then his other fingers putting the fucking chicken on the fork. It was just a gong show. R.A. was a great judge because he, he, he deemed me the winner, but I've never in my life seen anything like that. I'd rather watch somebody take a shit on the street than <laughs> see somebody hold a fork and eat like that. <laughs> And I also guys, think I also to get back to your little uh, <laughs> intro biz. I don't I don't know off the top of my head. I cannot think of one thing I would wait ninety minutes in line for. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I, can you guys just like? Are you guys? I'm not a big line guy. I, I do guarantee I Ra's been front. a guy to wait for a, for a TV on Black Friday in the scraps. <laughs> nah. No way. Busting into I, a I Best think, Buy throwing elbows. No, he actually waits in line when William Sonoma drops their new fork and knife silverware <laughs> line so he can hold a fuck. Hey, okay. you guys been out to you me enough. You know I don't really hold my silverware that day. I was kind of doing it like a little kid hold, holding them in each hand like that. So then I just continued to do that. I normally don't hold my silverware like that. I thought it would be we kept funny for the content. Oh, but. it was fucking hilarious. I mean, that was that's what everybody was commenting about. That was now, the talking uh, point. Yeah. I thought I thought they would have showed the clip. Maybe it's in the outtakes of me just eating the garlic, like straight up eating garlic cloves. That like. was savage. I couldn't believe you did that. You did that and didn't even bat an eye. Yeah. Now uh, I mentioned garlic a caveman. Really I'm pretty sure was cave- numb. We were in Ca- New York City. Yeah. Uh, uh, caveman probably didn't have utensils, so that was probably another stupid example by me. Um, no, because a lot of people say like you're eating like a caveman, but. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were whittling away some rocks and you know, sticks to maybe make something to help them pick up food, right? And shovel I mean, it in their mouth? Okay. When they were cooking meat in the, in an open flame, they can't just grab it off the, the fire. They must have had something that, you know, a spatula in the caveman days might have been just a little different than we imagined. So I don't sure. think that was that dumb of you, Biz. We're not historians, but, uh, you know, there's some theories, so we'll, we'll have to look into it. R.A., what, uh, what do you got going? Um, one more thing I have. Uh, I actually like uh, – this is from another podcast I've listened to in the past, and every week they do uh, Maya Culpa. Is that what it is, R.A.? M- Mia Culpa, Mia Culpa, yeah. Same. Mia Culpa, uh, excuse me, I messed up the pronunciation of that, but – I kind of almost think we should start it because we fuck up so many things in the pod where it'd be almost nice occasionally to just start off. I have one. R.A. said the, the, the lines of the song, don't oh, worry, be God. happy. And I said Bob Marley. I, <laughs> no, thought, I thought for I, sure it was Bob Marley that I, sang that. I, so did I. I don't know. I just thought of 
of Bob Marley and singing about uh, don't worry about a thing, you know, and, and it just, ju- but don't worry, be happy is not Bob Marley. And there are some Bob Marley stands out there who let it be known to your boy, Witty, that I am foolish for thinking he would ever sing a song that they, that they claimed to be that bad. So, I mean, I, my mea culpa. And who, I, who, I got called the original. Not, it's Bobby McFerrin who sings this. Don't worry, be happy. And I got called though. Cause I didn't catch it. Because I actually was goofing on you, and you, neither one of you has caught it out. Because when you say worry, you say worry. So I was like, don't worry, be happy. And What do I you say? Just, you don't say worry. You say worry, like like as if it was spelled am W-E-R-R-Y, am worry. I, so I says, don't I'm worry, worried, be right? happy. Yeah, whole, I was making fun of you. Is that not how you're supposed to say it? It's. I mean, hey, I'm the last guy to make fun of the way people pronounce words, but it's worry. And you say worry. It's just one of those little quirks you have like we all have so no one even caught that I was goof on you but because I was concentrating on ranking on you I didn't even catch you say Bob Molly so I got fucking shit on for not catching you fucking up and saying Here's Bob Molly uh, uh, a Bob, Mar- Bob Marley fans and I love Bob Marley great music to listen to I, I really enjoy it but I-, I would love to be able to get a true poll of how many people he- here don't worry be happy and just immediately think Bob Marley I would uh, say I'm not the only one of people I would say Thank 50% you. of people. I didn't even bat an eye at it. And of course, RA, your demographic would have been all over you. Yeah, now, they were. I want to stick on the music subject. I thought it was a, a pretty interesting week with uh, with all the antics that Kanye West is up to. I know RA, I, I don't think you're probably the biggest Kanye West guy, but I keep he's scro- like, strong when I scrolling when I see his name. Yeah, so I, I I love his more so of his old music. I think he's a true and true artist. I mean, some of his albums are some of the most like my favorite ones. I, I'll listen to even front to back. Obviously, his stuff from the early beginning, like uh, you know, graduation and all that stuff. But he's dropping a new album with, and he did a seven song listening party at the Atlanta Falcon Stadium. I think it's called the Mercedes Benz Stadium. And he's not quite done the album. Apparently, he was supposed to drop. So every time he drops an album, it's like an, an event. So, of course, doesn't come out when it's supposed to. But I think it was $20 a ticket and about 40,000 people ended up showing up to the stadium just to listen to seven of his songs. And That's when be- you know, dude, you're big time. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and he was wearing all this uh, all this red clothing that he's going to be dropping with The Gap because he ended up collabing with The, the Gap and, and they're going to be releasing clothing. So they had this big poofy red jacket on. He won't show his face. That's the mode he's in now. So he's been wearing a mask. You can't see. He got see plastic what- surgery. I I'd never considered that. I, I, I doubt that. Uh, but now because he's not finished the album, he's living out of the stadium to finish it. No. So they had a soccer game there the other day and he was just like scrolling around watching the soccer game. But no. he's, so, so he's taking a page out of the red deer rebels book and he's living up in one of the boxes. <laughs> what do you think? Arthur blanks charging him for rent to stay at the Mercedes. It's Mercedes stadium. Isn't it? All right. It is. Yeah, Mercedes Stadium, yeah. Dome, or whatever. Just, yeah. yeah, you could stay here. It's just uh, 400000 a month. The thing that's crazy is that if he hasn't released the album and he's willing to have the watch party for the first seven songs, was he not worried that like, people are going to record it and then all of a sudden, you know, songs are dropping before? I think it builds the hype for yeah. the actual album drop, the and that's, that's also part of it. Now, I mentioned that uh, that poofy red jacket. I'd imagine they're going to sell a gazillion of those because he sold a gazillion silly shoes that he made. So he's just got so many hype beasts, and like he, you know, he's obviously impacted a, a major part of, of the culture, at least people who love the rap music. I mean, Grinelli, like you're a little bit younger. Like anytime anything Kanye pops up, I'm intrigued by what's going on. Dude, I think the that whole he's- internet stopped. The whole internet stopped once the clip started coming out about that that watch party. Like when Jay Z jumped back on a song with Kanye West after their Jay Z was there. Jay Z like- jumped back on a song with Kanye, and they have like they've had that whole beef. So it was like it that 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 made the internet break for a little bit. And apparently he recorded the 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 part of the song that he did at like 4 p.m. and then like sent it to him and then he was able to drop it that night. So I don't know. All Biz right. Two Chains was backstage recording vocals right before the show. Right before the show went on, Two Chains was backstage and they were editing shit so he could put it in the song. So so there's a, probably a large amount of people that are listening right now who are hockey fans who aren't Kanye fans and who are just ah I get it. He's a polarizing figure. You either love him or you hate him. And I just figured I'd, I'd mention him off the hop, considering we were talking about music. That's but w- all right. What, what's your overall opinion? I know he's a, he's a very polarizing guy. I mean, honestly, I really don't. 
I've never, I'm not familiar with his music. I know it's a wicked old guy take. I just never really listened to his shit. I, I really don't have much of an opinion on him one way or the other. I, I can't say I like him or I hate him. I'm just, I'm pretty neutral on him. I mean, I don't, I don't have, I'm not a fan of his, but I, I just, I'm indifferent, man. I, yeah, I, no I kind of, feelings. I kind of disagree, Biz, a little bit. I don't think it's like a love or hate Kanye. I think I'm, I'm in the same boat. I, a couple of his songs I love. I think the guy's a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puff. <laughs> uh, but in the end, you know, I don't, I don't really have that strong yeah. of opinion about him. About him, I was. Yeah, I, 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 th- I will say, I think part of taking away his past music success and how big of a deal he is in the rap game and the music industry, I, I really do think part of it is that people never know what he's going to do next. Next, yeah. and 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 I know there's probably tons of stuff out there that that would give people reasons to dislike him, but the only one I can think of as a totally uh, unbiased like fan is is what he did to Taylor Swift. That was a scumbag move when he ran Hopping on stage on and said, you shouldn't have won. That was kind of tough look. Or, or when he said he made her famous on a track. And, and, then, and then, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he, he's done quite a few. Things. And I was talking so to my buddy. made more money in music, Taylor Swift or Kanye? Oh, well, I would say maybe music, uh, Taylor, but clothing. Yeah, no, no, I everything. just meant music. Yeah, I know yeah. he's got, he's got all So of I was talking to my good friend, uh, Jeff Jacobson, by the way. Happy birthday to him. He just Attaboy, had his birthday. Jeff. Happy yeah. birthday, buddy. He described the best. He's kind of a, a natural con- contrarian where it seems like he'll go against the grain on most subjects it, just in order to kick up dust. So I don't know. I'll leave it at that. And uh, I don't know if we're going to get the hockey uh, right about now. All right. Yeah, we can get there shortly. Uh, first, we do want to mention we have a pair of guests coming up today. We have NHL agent Bane Pettinger. We have spent some time with him, got some great stories, his whole backstory as well. Uh, and we get the living legend himself, Terry Ryan, joins us in, in a little bit. So we got a pair of interviews. Uh, all, while we're doing birthdays, I know he doesn't listen, uh, Biz, but happy 78th birthday to Mick Jagger today, Monday the 26th, 78 years old. He's been doing this stuff for almost 60 years. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, yeah. Make sure to hit your local liquor store and grab some new Mickey size Pink Whitney. Got about six more weeks of summer. So make sure you stock up for all your pool parties and all your cottage rippers. The extra smooth taste makes it the best drink from the pregame to the after party. Pink Whitney. And uh, the big news, boys, last week, everybody was waiting for the Seattle expansion draft. I know we had the entry draft as well, but I think there was a lot more anticipation for the Seattle draft. Uh, and I think they kind of went about it a different way. A lot of people had their mock drafts, and it didn't really go the way uh, most people expected. They had to pick 30 players. Uh, they also took seven in the draft itself. They ended up taking 15 forwards, 12 defensemen, uh, three goaltenders. Uh, they get nine guys making under a million dollars. Uh, they still got a few restricted free agents, so they can just let those guys become unrestricted and, and almost – they had to pick these guys because they had to pick every guy from every team. I think they're not even going to probably sign some of these guys. Uh, right now at the cap, they're just under 51 mil. They still can spend up to uh, 30, another 31 million. Free agency starts Wednesday. Wait, let's go to you first. What was your take on the, on the whole expansion draft itself? Um, all right, bunch of different takes. Now, before we get into the player news... Dr. Evil Frank Saravalli. <laughs> <laughs> oh, With my just God. Amazing, amazing ability to completely ruin the expansion draft for the NHL. Now, having said that, if you don't know what I mean, he broke every single pick. <laughs> there was absolutely no suspense. Every pick was known before the actual event that night uh, in Seattle, which was pretty good. I mean, you know, I, I think it was cool having uh, Eberly was there, Giordano was there, a few others that I'm forgetting. Excuse Kevin me, Weeks but- literally hit every square inch of the city. Yeah, exactly. Eight weeks he was chucking the fish. Marshawn Lynch was making picks, but I do not at all, at all blame Frank. Frank was doing his job. He's a journalist, and I, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that the NHL was very upset. Now, that's not shocking. I think they might have talked to Sportsnet, yeah. TSN, ESPN, maybe, and said, guys, you know, keep this quiet. Well, Frank does not work for any of those companies. He's, uh, I think he's with the Daily Faceoff now. I don't know if he's the owner or he basically is the big dog there. He's an enormous name in terms of breaking news in hockey, along with LeBron, Drager, you know, all the big names, Elliot. Bobby Margarita. Bobby Margarita, who's just chilling now. You know he's probably crushed at 640 on a Monday. Nailed every single pick in the first round. So he's doing his job, right? It's on the NHL. You fucked up. You had the draft. You had all the, the teams had to submit the names at 10 a.m. The thing didn't go on till 10 hours later. What do you think was going to happen? So I don't know. And I understand that they had to do it in advance because they had to get guys into Seattle. And there was a, an, a, an issue in terms of like getting the people there that they wanted there. And it wasn't enough time to have it all be live. I understand. But you cannot at all blame Frank. The guy's doing his job. He's breaking stories. He's a reporter. He just happened to really ruin the NHL's day. 
Well, and, and on top of that, though, if you're a fan where you wanted it to be a surprise, just stay off social media. And I mean, Vince, same goes for TV shows, same goes for movies. Like, if you if, you're, if you think you might see a spoiler, just avoid the apps. Yeah, no? and Biz, with one of his top tweets, uh, for anyone not on Twitter, as Frank broke, like, the <laughs> 20th selection of the expansion draft happening that night, Biz retweeted, don't ever bring this guy to a gender reveal party. <laughs> Just because just he will just, he'll be like, it's a boy. <laughs> and uh, Seattle saw, signed Everly to a four year extension. I dug into the icing. It's a boy. Uh, all right. So, all right, what was your opinion on how it all came out? Were you in the same boat as Wit where you're like, guys, he's just doing his job? Oh, 100%. Uh, everyone who was complaining about him, I'm like, this is his job to, to, to get this stuff and, and get turn it over to people, get, get the sources to tell you shit. And then you tell the public now. He, he doesn't. He's not beholden to anybody. Like Witt said, I'm sure the the league partners were probably asked to not t- uh, tweet that shit out. But what he did was 100 percent his job. I think it's on the NHL for for having such a huge window and where the member clubs were giving him this information. I mean, he didn't make it up. People from the teams were giving it to him. So right, I got no problem uh, with what or, he did. Or there's a source within the PA. I don't necessarily. I'm definitely thinking there were some teams telling him, but right. He, it, he might have just got a master sheet. You're right. Well, he could have just got a master sheet from one source. But now the funny thing is that. It's like a scene out of Mission Impossible. He's like, oh, no, I'm just thinking. Hey, with Tom Cruise. And then he catches the sweat, the beat of sweat. But I will say, though, you know whose fucking mainframe he didn't hack, at least until late? Stevie Y. You'd be fucking why nothing it's, coming out of that camp. Oh yeah. You'll be. So I, I ended up posting something from, uh, you remember when they had it Braveheart when they brought him up and they try to torture him to get him to, to what do they tr- try to get him to say? Uh, mercy. Just say mercy, mercy. Say, say mercy. mercy and it'll say, all end. It'll all end. No, he wouldn't. No. One of the most emotional scenes. And you see, as he's screaming it, you see his buddy. It's just an amazing movie. Braveheart all timer. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> How happy was Frank? Because he's like, wait a minute. Nobody else is breaking anything. <laughs> like He's like, this is unbelievable. I get to do every one. Yeah. I don't have to worry about anyone stepping on my toes. Hey, and then he, and then he kind of dropped, uh, Mike dropped it when he's like, everybody have a great expansion draft tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> or tonight, excuse me. Oh, Felt like tomorrow. That's how what? long the rollout was. There's another thing I thought uh, people were expecting all these side deals or trades like, you know, Vegas did years ago. And it seems like all the other GMs learned their lesson because there were absolutely no side deals, no trades. Um, Seattle just took a lot of guys, I think, off the radar that people weren't expecting them to take. Wait, I know you wanted to follow up. Yeah, it's a good point by URA. And, and I think there's a bunch of different factors. Now, part of it is. Team smartened up, right? Teams got taken to the cleaners in 2017. There was no, um, you know, there wasn't going to be like a Shea Theodore available, right? Teams had enough time and an advance warning after what happened with Vegas to kind of really lock up players and make sure they wouldn't lose certain guys. I was still very surprised. I think, was there was there no side deals? There wasn't even one? Um, oh, Not- Pitlick. Pitlick ended. They ended up moving him. That was after, though. Yeah, yeah so that was after. So, the one thing is, I think teams were definitely aware of what was happening. I also think, you know, when, when Francis is calling, it's almost like scary in a sense of like, what is he going to try to do to us here? He's trying to figure out something. So I think in past and what happened in Vegas, teams did learn. Now, what we'll see after Wednesday uh, or tomorrow for everyone listening after free agency is they might, like R.A. said, not sign some of the guys they pick. They can still make deals. They can still take on enormous cap hits and get a bunch of draft picks in return for teams looking to get out of cap misery and just get rid of some guys to create some more room for themselves. So I don't think by any means Seattle's like uh, wheeling and dealing is over, but it was very surprising to not see those side deals. I think just because of what everyone expected after the last time this went down. Yeah. Yeah, it just seemed like both sides kind of learned. And then, and then yeah. of course, you know, $30 million in cap space, they're going to be able to do a and, – and there's probably still some guys that might even get bought out or traded for really cheap. I mean, I think people are probably most surprised that they didn't pick up Tarasenko. Would that be one? Um, yeah, I think Tarasenko was surprising. I think James Van Riems like, was surprising. Uh, they could have had Duchesne or Johansson. Now, for me, looking at their draft – Unless on Wednesday you hear about uh, Landeskog signing there or um, 
Dougie Hamilton say, like another big UFA, it just looks like they are really, really focused on three to three years from now. Yeah. And totally not even trying to win now. Where I don't even necessarily know if Vegas was trying to. They just realized a couple games in, they were a very solid club. But I think in looking at their selections and how it's gone on, they are not interested and they understand this year they will struggle and maybe next year they'll struggle and they're all about the future, which makes more sense. You know, that wasn't going to happen like it did before. And now you understand, all right, this team's building towards these next three, four years. I feel like they got something up their sleeve. They're still not playing another game for, for three months. I mean, they got, yeah. like I said, almost $31 million cap space. And I love our boy Chief, but when he had that blog, they're tanking for next year's draft or something. It's like... Come on, man. They just they just had their expansion draft. They're not they're not gonna tank for a pick. I mean, it's not I don't think it's a generational talent coming along like a Crosby or McDavid in the down the pike. I just think that they they probably have a few things up their sleeve that we have no idea about, namely like unrestricted free agents that they can sign Wednesday morning. Oh, all right, G, I think some people oh, G's would argue hopping with in you. here. What do we got uh, here, right, G? Yeah. Oh, 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 hold on, hold on. We got G. I G, think some G. people would argue with you. I think some people would say that that they believe that Shane Wright or Connor Bedard is a potential franchise changing player. Well, Bedard's not next year, but Shane Wright is. And I don't, do it's tank? funny. I talked to somebody uh, in the front office of an NHL team. And I talked about Good luck like, beating the, whole, the coyotes out of that one. Oh, Jesus Christ. The coyotes. We'll get to them later. We got to talk about tanking and the idea of tanking. And the idea is that, you know, we got to get better. We got to just lose now to get better in the future. And understandably you, you do become great in this league through the draft. You've seen Tampa, you've seen all these other teams do it through the draft, but the whole thought of tanking is hard because what it, what it, the problems it presents is the culture of losing and the culture of never understanding like battling in games and trying to win and getting some success and having young guys feel success and the growth of becoming a good team. And then all of a sudden, man, yeah, there's, there's some home runs and drafts, but you never know. And all of a sudden, if you're tanking and you're tanking, and I'm not saying Edmonton was doing it on purpose, but where are they at, dude? And look how many fucking first overall picks they've had. So the idea of tanking is so scary to some fan bases because it's like, it's not even a guarantee. It is not a guarantee you'll be good. So I, I, I think RA is right in the sense that there's more to come. And after free agency, it'll really change. But we'll see. Because if they are really bad all year, or they don't make any more moves. We could see a team that really struggles and ends up getting that first overall pick with ease. Yeah. And all, that's the other thing. The, the new lottery system, it's not even a guarantee at all. So I'm with you, R.A. Fuck, Chief. <laughs> well, I'm not going to go that far. But, uh, and also, too, I love they, they did sign three free agents, guys who could have been unrestricted by Wednesday, but these guys wanted to stay in Seattle. They got picked by them. They decided to stay there. Jamie Oleksiak, five years, 4.6 million a year. Adam Larson, four years, four million a year. And goaltender Chris Dreger, three years times 3.5 mil. I mean, he became a number one goalie, I'd say, this year. You look at their top four D, Giordano, Alexiak, Larson, Susie. These guys are bona fide NHLs, man. I mean, I don't think this is a, a total scrub team by any chance, especially when we see what they do up front. Um, I got to hop in there. And uh, Penny Alexiak, shout out to her for helping Canada win a silver medal. So quite the quite the week for that family. Uh, nice little contract for, for Jamie as well. Uh, I got to talk about Edmonton. I ended up deleting the tweet because I felt a little bit bad. Yeah, I'm a tweet you deleter. Deleted a tweet, man. I, yeah, I went. I was just like, I, nah, I basically I was. I was basically asking if Holland was still working for Detroit with some of the moves he's made, like saying maybe it's an inside job. And then I wrote hashtag Eyes are Plan, but maybe a little. I know, I know, terrible. I gotta, was it worth a delete or yes, yes or no? No, I think Eyes are hashtag Eyes are Plan. Just should <laughs> that's enough yeah, to keep it. Should live because okay. I haven't heard that. Well, I just Did you but, make that but, up. No, no, no. That's been oh. going on because he's been fucking lighting everybody up as far as trades are concerned. And we're going to get to that later. But oh, he just bent Carolina over and just smacked okay. him in the face. So we'll, after. OK, we'll talk about that later. But guys lo losing Larson, I mean, oh, my goodness. That's, you know, we talk about how hard it is for them to get free agents and, and that. You know, getting getting Duncan Keith with Larson, that's an improvement. Now you're basically just swapping them out where Larson's, you know, as far as at least like proven over the last couple of seasons that he is a little bit superior in play. Not saying Duncan Keith can't go there and get back to where in, in what we know of Duncan Keith. Right. Um, and then they ended up in the draft. Tr trading and, and, you know, goaltending. I don't want to say goaltending has been an issue because I think Smitty had a great year last year. I think that they, he did somewhat of a good job and lock him in for a very low number this, uh, the next two, two years, years though, two years right? is a little surprising, but they, they have the 20th pick Wallstead, who was labeled as the number one goalie in the draft. He ended up becoming the second goalie picked. 
He's at 20th. And what do they do? They trade away the pick. And then he ends up getting picked up by who? Nashville ended up getting him 20th. Help me out here, G. You're the draft specialist. I believe it was Minnesota, Fizz. You're, you're the best goalie in the draft available. That's maybe been an issue, or at least you have to dress moving forward, and then you end up moving on from it. And and I think uh, Kosa was the other uh, kid, I believe his last name. He was the big goaltender, 6'6", out of Edmonton. Maybe more upside, and that's who Iserman ended up trading up and picking. Shockingly, Vasilevsky 2.0. But – this Wallstead was was probably the most NHL ready of the goalies being able to be selected because he was playing pro over in Sweden. And, you know, if you look at his highlights, people are saying, man, this guy is as calm as they come. Kevin Weeks was, we, and, and I get it. It's, it's a first round draft pick. We don't know what's going to happen, but just some of these moves. And now you hear, that, you know, he's going to throw seven years at Hyman, who is beloved in Toronto. But I mean, at seven years, you're going to have to lock him in for 5.5 a year. How's that going to look in, three, four years. I mean, I mean, I'm, That's and I'm not trying what to, we're talking about. No, that, that, that nowadays they're like signing these deals thinking about three, four years. It's so different. Yeah. It, it, and, and, and that, that could be a deal. We got, we got away from Seattle. Quick. I got a couple more things to say, but that could be a deal where it's like, we gotta, we gotta do something for McDavid. That's right. <laughs> you and know? that's what it comes down to. Cause it's desperation because they do have to overpay free agents. And, and, I, and like I said, Hyman's provided a lot to that Toronto lineup. He's a, he's a honey badger. But I mean, also like, I mean, you're giving five and a half million for seven years to a guy who had one goal in playoffs last year. Like, yeah. it's like, and what? the thing about Larson, like, yeah, he had is... a good regular season. Well, I might have a good regular season playing with Marner and Matthews. Fuck, fuck <laughs> eh. it, uh, carried away. The thing about exactly the thing about Larson, you can't you can't really blame Holland. That they had that dough for him. And, and he just didn't want to be there anymore. You know, that's a guy who doesn't, he didn't want to be in Edmonton. He wanted to be somewhere else. So in a sense, like you really, you really can't blame Ken Holland for that. That was just his decision, his, his choice to be, like, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm. I, I mean, they could offer him even a little bit more. We don't know. And that's why I deleted the tweet. My apologies, Ken Holland. Plan. Also at uh, local boy, uh, Hingham's Maddie Benia's first ever draft pick, Seattle history, taken number two overall. This kid is a dead ringer for Gary Goldman, the comedian. Did, did you see his interview? Looks, you know, Gary Goldman, the comedian, looks exactly so tell like me what he's dude. from. So he's pretty good on the mic already, and I think his mom was in, even in Broadway. So he's got Ooh. some uh, some experience in, in talking publicly, and I thought he sound, sounded great, but I don't I don't get the reference, though, with the Goldman. I don't know who that is. He's just – he's a comedian. He's been around for a long time. I don't know when his last special What's was. What's he in? He's – He's a comedian. I don't know what movies he's in. He's just done a bunch of stand-up specials, like on Netflix. He's been around okay. for probably 25, 30 years. I figured you'd know him of all of all people. He's a local guy. North Shore guy, not a Salt Shore guy. But Oh, I don't know North Shore people. Oh, okay. I've actually never seen that person. G's to show us the picture, but yeah. that is Matty Benier. So great call on the Doppeldanger already. We got to uh, <laughs> shout out Emily Kaplan. She was doing the like part of the draft breakdowns about the prospects and like some fun facts about them. And uh, this Benier's kid's a, a big uh, Dr. P- P- uh, Pimple Popper uh, fan. He actually went uh, to, I think his, I think he, he's, uh, he's going to get into dermatology. I don't know how long he's going to stay at school. Given how good he is, I mean, it sounds like you know, in a couple of years, he might be NHL ready. Especially with the fact that he could play the university, the, right the University of Michigan, is a fucking NHL team right now. Do you want to talk about that? We did. We went over Owen Powers, who who ended up going or Owen Power. I call him Powers, like Austin Powers. Um, he had a he had a pretty funny uh, draft video with uh, Grandma getting excited in the front row, and then I I don't know if it was his old man or his grandpa who accidentally like kind of. Gave you a tit grab. I know. Yes. I don't know if it was that his girlfriend or his sister. <laughs> no idea. Yeah, but, just uh, a tit grab in celebration. By no means on purpose, I don't think. No, but no, definitely I, completely a funny accidental. Accident, a funny accident to get to witness. Very happy for that guy. Buffalo goes with another defenseman in their first overall pick. It was Rasmus Stalin before. Um, quickly about Beneers. I think that it's been said everywhere. Ron Francis was really into trying to find guys who played the game the way he did. Yeah. Now, I mean, that's near impossible. One, one of the all-time greats, but this guy is fucking awesome. He skates like the wind. He has offensive ability. He plays on the other side of the puck. I just got the chance to watch him at World Championships the most. Oh, my God. He Now, granted, this year's World Championship was by no means like one of their top, you know, the, the top players weren't there and things like that, but fuck, this kid is awesome. And I think a lot of people looked at Kent Johnson, who Columbus ended up taking, who played at Michigan, as like the number one center available. Um, but in the end, they went with Beneers. I think Francis sees a little bit of himself in him, and I love the pick. 
Yeah, uh, they said uh, far and above the best two-way center in the draft. Has an unbelievable motor. We had uh, So we did a Pink Whitney dr- uh, draft show with Shane Doan. Witt was unable to attend because he had prior uh, engagements. But we figured, hey, why not hop on and, and, and shoot the shit? Because Shane Doan's kid actually ended up getting drafted by the Coyotes in the second round. But he did a good job of breaking down some of these top picks. I think we talked about the top 15. So if you guys could head over to our YouTube channel, you can check that out. But yeah, he, he said that he looks a little bit like uh, Mike Madonna when he's skating because he's got the jersey flapping in the wind. Now, people don't, hey, he ain't fucking Mike Madonna. He's got a long way to go to being one of the best American born players ever, but uh, some, some definitely some high praises for the second overall pick and guys for the top five out of Michigan. It's insane. I, I don't think we're ever going to see that again. No, there's no way that I'll ever have. I'm, I'm not positive. But there's no way that's happened with a junior team, right? You know, juniors built a little different, right? You're not going to have that many studs like that age on one junior team, considering there's a draft and in college, you can choose where you want to go. But wow, if Michigan doesn't win it all next year, they're the biggest bunch of scrubs I've ever seen. They have a five. (laughs) It's they have. They also have Pat Brisson's son who was picked in the first round last year. They have another player who was picked. I think I think their goalie was a high pick last year, too, right? Is that is that yeah? So so we're I mean, giving them wagon team. status now. Um, Ann Arbor is a great town. You know they got a, a football program that's pathetic now, but still a, a top football program known around the country. It's a great school nonetheless. The other funny thing about Beniers I meant to mention is he was committed to play at Harvard, um, and then the Ivy League so pathetic they canceled all their sports last year. So the kids like uh, you know I'm a tough top draft prospect i gotta i gotta go somewhere so you went to michigan late but what i was gonna say about michigan is it's a great town it's a great school uh it's an awesome awesome arena yost arena is sick great atmosphere and that team is just built to dominate this season because never before like you said biz have you seen this many top prospects on one college team yeah i know i know we weren't supposed to dive into the draft but that goes uh that goes without saying our add took over and last thing to throw it back to you ra uh, regarding Emily Kaplan's comments about him being a big uh, Dr. Pimple Popper fan. Oh. Have you ever seen any of those videos? No, I refuse to watch them. I don't know why anybody would want to watch that stuff. It, I mean, it's, it's why are you laughing, fan. G? It's I'd rather so eat, foul. I, I don't I'd rather it. hold my fork like RA does than watch that show. I don't hate the pimple poppers. I don't mind like, it. It's like there's a lot of fans because you're so used to popping yours. Exactly. <laughs> I would. I would rather watch that guy. That video of the guy, homeless guy shitting in L.A. that you showed earlier. I would rather watch that in the loop okay. than watch one pimple get popped. Yeah. It, is, gonna, it is so gross. You're dude. gonna watch a few fucking pimples pop if uh, if I get a, get in the ring with Jake Paul too. That fucking guy. Oh. This I, has to, I think this has to happen now. This might, this might happen. This I might think, actually. I think happen. it has to happen. He, he, you can't let him talk shit that shit about you. Of course. What did he, he say? All right, you're going to be my Polly. What did he that, say? Actually, Paul no, was, responded. No, no, it was someone in the office who said that Biz couldn't beat Jake Paul. Someone, who? Uh, who? They didn't say who it was. It was the Viva. Oh the my! Thing. Who? Who? Who released it then? Viva the stool just anonymously quoted someone in the office. Oh, said, you cowards! No. Running that fucking Twitter well, feed. You didn't Kyle say said who it. said it. Yeah, I mean, someone whoever said it probably didn't want to have their their fucking name name so that's probably why they the only reason i want to fight this guy is because i think that what they've done three million yeah well that too um (laughs) what they've done to disgrace the game of boxing is 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 a a joke and i want to fucking embarrass them i want to put them right on their ass both of them and hopefully i could start with jake dr pimple popper himself anyway ring ring. oh uh, one last thing um Oh no, we're talking draft later. We're talking draft later. Sorry. You guys have any uh, any other Seattle thoughts that you wanted to share? Um, I don't want to move on. Yeah, I think just... I just think overall the biggest names, you know, Giordano, and then I think Eberly and Yanni Gord. I'd, I'd mention as the as the other two guys that really, you know, you notice very good players. Yanni Gord's going to make that team legit. Uh, I don't know how long he'll be there. I don't know how long it is until he's a UF. Oh no, he just signed a long deal, so he's got a while there. So that's a great player to have. You feel for him a little bit. I mean, he's got his two cups, but uh, he's going to be in one for a little bit on a team that probably will struggle. You know why you kind of feel for him a little bit? Well, other, well, I guess it goes no state tax to no state tax, but like it'd be it'd be decent if like he only had one year left. That way, he could at least either if he likes it, sign a bigger ticket maybe. Yeah. But yeah, now you've already signed the deal. You just won the two cups of the place that you love. And then now it's like, well, you don't get to play with those guys that you won with anymore. So, well, hey, our buddy Alex Kalorn didn't get picked. So, you know, he's fired up. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why we got him on the show. He just wanted to announce the whole world. Don't even think about it. 
That was pretty funny. Uh, Wait, you just mentioned, actually, you both mentioned Emily Kaplan from ESPN. Uh, Last week, this news actually came out Monday, right after we taped uh, Nashville prospect Luke Prokop announced in an Instagram post that he's gay. He's the first player under NHL contract to do so. Uh, He's a 19-year-old defenseman who was taken in the third round of the 2020 draft. Uh, And he said on his Instagram, I'm sorry, he said to Emily, I was lying in bed one night, had just deleted a dating app for the fourth or fifth time, and I was extremely frustrated because I couldn't be my true, authentic self. And that moment I said, enough is enough. I'm accepting who I am. I want to live the way I want to. And I want to accept myself as a gay man. And the organization of teammates uh, on social media have been great supporting him. And Biz, I know that that had a part of the reason why you wanted to bring on Bain this show, right? Yeah, Luke actually reached out to Bain because Bain uh, ended up coming out in 2020. And uh, he's a longtime friend of mine. And I, you know, I think most of our friend group is aware, but as he's going to mention in the interview, and I don't want to give too much of it up, you know, he explained, you know, the whole process of having to go through it. And, and, you know, and of course with Luke reaching out to him and, and Bain taking the steps that he did in order to announce it publicly. And people will ask sometimes like, Oh, well, why does this need to be news? Well, it needs to be news to make it comfortable for the next person to be able to announce it. So then the next person can feel comfortable being them true selves. So, so it was it was great to have him on. He's worked with Hockey Canada. He's a friend of mine. And we just, guys, we think it's an important subject. And, you know, we didn't reach out to Luke because he's probably been doing a lot of media. And, you know, we want to probably let him, like, you know, rest a little bit after this. Although he did go on 31 Thoughts with Elliot Friedman and Jeff Merrick, two of the best in the business. They had an interview with him. So go, he did, excuse me, go check it out there. And I really hope that you guys enjoy Bain and his story as well. Yeah, and and for Luke, um, if if people are out there actually saying why does this need to be news, you you have a P for a brain because I I am I, I don't know this kid, but like so happy for him. Yeah, and forget like the sports aspect of it. It's more, I feel so bad for any person who is gay and and isn't able to live their true life and be honest with their friends and their family because that must be such torture for people. So any single time you hear a story about somebody coming out, I do think it's worth reading and hearing about it because you you're you're literally you're literally witnessing somebody become more free in themselves and their life. And I can't imagine how amazing that feels for that kid. And it took a lot of balls. I wish it didn't take balls, but it did. And hopefully in the future, because of guys like him and because of guys like Bain within the sports world, hockey world, whatever you're talking about, it'll become easier for people who are gay to come out and, and, and announce who they true truly are. So it's very happy to see that news. And before we throw it over to Bain, I just want to remind everyone that this interview is brought to you by our friends at body armor. Today's athletes deserve more than just your grandfather's tired old salty sports drink with its full of artificial shit. Enter Body Armor. It's made with potassium-packed electrolytes, antioxidants, and B B vitamins, plus no artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners are trash for your health. Stay away from them. There's no flavors or dyes, and Body Armor Sports Drink provides hardworking hydration and more. Plus, it tastes phenomenal. Ask any of us. We love it. We drink it constantly. Body Armor helps today's athletes stay on top of their game. Body Armor is also ideal for keeping yourself hydrated during the hot summer months, and it's why I'm slugging a few of these daily on the golf course. You got to stay energized. You crush the Body Armor. Body Armor. It's available for purchase in-store and on Amazon. That's big. Amazon Prime. Go there now or go to drinkbodyarmor.com for more info so now we want to thank bane pettinger very much for joining and here he is well with unrestricted free agency lumen and a pair of drafts within a few days we thought it'd be a good time to bring on an agent back on in addition to repping players at caa hockey our next guest also worked for hockey canada for nearly a decade as his teams racked up some serious gold in various tournaments thanks so much for joining us on the spit and chicklets podcast bane pettinger how's the summer going buddy it's good. I'm back in Toronto now for, you know, the crazy week here, a free agency expansion draft yesterday and uh, the NHL draft tomorrow night and Saturday. So busy time for us in the agency world right now. I mean, what, do you, what are the, what are the agents uh, make of, uh, of all the insiders busting out all the, 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 basically breaking all the stories and ruining the expansion draft. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why we even needed to watch last night, but uh, it was good. It was uh, Frank and uh, all the guys. Yeah. I, I think I put that one on the NHL though. They had 10 hours to, uh, you know, pretty between when they submitted and I don't know what they expected the media to do. They're doing their job, you know, but also when you look back, they obviously had to get those guys in for the stage, you know, the geos and the guys from Toronto and stuff to get them in for the big, Hoopla last night on the lake, but it looked awesome there. I love the the octopus on the yacht. That was, I think, the highlight. They should have done the expansion disco. 
that a late night, uh, late night release, you would have fucking been there. <laughs> oh yeah. I wondered what those guys were doing after, uh, last night, once they got off the stage, if they were going out with Marshawn and Gary Payton and those guys. Do you Not notice, more. um, do you notice like clients of yours and guys you work with around free agency, they start texting, calling you more, they start feeling the anxiety of what's going to happen. Big time. Yeah. Free agents. You definitely know who is a free agent and who's locked up and getting their signing bonus on July 1st. So, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, You're you like, know, what's you up, Painter? How you doing, bro? Yeah. I'm just chilling. Yeah. And then the other calls are all work, uh, wondering when, where are we playing next year? When are you getting me a job and what have you done for me lately? So no, it's all good. Now, yeah. hey, uh, so RA didn't mention it in the intro. I figured I'd take it over. Uh, one of the major components to getting in this, on this podcast today was, uh, Luke Prokop. He ends up being the first uh, active player under contract to come out as gay, um, following the lead of, of of some other guys who have done it before him. And I know that you were a main component and a guy that he talked to in order before he did did it because you last year during the pandemic ended up coming out as gay as well. And um, from a guy who worked for Hockey Canada for a long time and who's involved involved with the hockey community, um, it was probably a you know a difficult decision. And and eventually you did, and you saw the outpouring of support. So we figured it was such an important issue to discuss because you know you, you see even sometimes online people are like, well, why did they feel the need to do that? And it's like, well, because you know it, it, you know it's 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 hard. It's it's not easy, right? Almost some of these guys feel like they're you know living a lie to a certain degree, and and by doing so, it ended up helping other people in the future end up coming out and and living their true life. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, uh, you know, my story, it, it, when I heard Luke's story, obviously, you know, he reached out uh, about a month before it came out and he said that my story, you know, kind of inspired him there. So that was humbling in its own right to, um, to have Luke reach out his agent, Jerry Johansson, to say that he saw my story in November through Pierre, very similar storytelling with a, an article in The Athletic. Um, and then obviously TSN and media follow up, you know, I'm a, I'm a pigeon compared to him. He's the signed NHL prospect. I'm just a, a team service guy that book buses and now an agent, but, uh, you know, for Luke to, to do that at age 19 is, is unbelievable. I came out at 33 and, uh, you know, I wasn't ready. Um, you know, when I look back at 19, I was playing junior hockey and riding the bus with the boys and, you know, thinking, you know, I don't know what I was thinking, but for him to do that and, and champion it at, at his age and the, and the microscope that he's under, you know, a, a high WHL draft pick, a third rounder signed prospect. This is Luke's job though, right? He, he gets a paycheck from the Nashville Predators, you know? So um, I think it's, it's tremendously courageous for him to step up the way he did it. You know, what he's going to be is kind of like a, a beacon for, for players. Because when I came out in November, the, the, the main question people always ask me was, when's a player going to come out? You know, it's great. We've got officials. We've got NHL executives. We've got an agent now. When's a player? Someone in the locker room that's around the boys that can change that culture. And um, for him to do it so suddenly, obviously after the Raiders player with Carl and Zib, um, you know, and then and then when, when Luke came out, it's, it's fantastic. So I helped out. I had a little conference call with some of the Nashville Predators boys just to – to prep them for it. You know, they're going to get some questions from media of, you know, dumb questions. Would you accept a gay teammate? Well, what do you mean? Would we accept them? If he can help us win hockey games, who cares? Right. And that's the biggest thing is that Luke wants to be an NHL player. He doesn't want to be that gay NHL player. So, you know what, it is a big deal and it needs to be celebrated because, you know, if, if Luke worked at RBC or a, a, a media outlet, it wouldn't even be a story, but it's because he's a signed NHL prospect and um, what he's doing to break down barriers in the game and just, you know, humanize it is, is admirable at his age. And I'm happy to help out in, in any way. That's very well said. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, did you go through a lot of times where you, where you thought, I don't know what they'll think if I come out and tell them the truth. And if so, it must have been incredible to see the amount of support you got from guys you, you considered and became true friends with like once you did come out. Yeah, it was always keeping my personal life separate from my hockey life. You know, I, had, I, I thought I had both of them sorted out. I was going to multiple Olympic Games, World Championships, World Juniors. You go on the road for a month and you're hanging out with the who's who of hockey and you're like, this is awesome. And you win a gold medal and you're like, this is great. And then you come home and you're kind of like, huh, I'm tired of the question of why don't you have a girlfriend? You know, why, you know, you're, you've got everything going off the ice, you know, I say off the ice, uh, you know, in the game, w w what's going on with your personal life. And I kind of just, you know, through my twenties, I was exploring and unsure. And then finally, you know, everyone thinks COVID was horrible. I, I actually thank COVID because I got get to go back to the Island where I'm from in Victoria and be with my, my brothers and my, my parents for four months. 
and really just put the noise away, you know, put the cell phone down of, you know, put the, you know, the, the pressures of we got to go here and then it's another weekend here in Scottsdale or it's another here and then you're pulled in a million directions and you always put it on the back burner. So for me, you know, 2020, as much as people hate it, for me, it, it, it changed my life. You know, I was able to go back and, and reset and find out who I am and, and what's important to me and, and really project that and had some, you know, conversations with my family and saying, hey, I really think that I can do something with this. And, you know, I'm ready to combine those worlds. And that was, you know, a blessing for me. And it was the, the best day of my life, you know, when Pierre did that article on November 5th there to, to get that out there and just shed a, a massive weight off my shoulders and really say, who cares? And it's 2021 now. And if anyone does have a problem with it, that's on them. And I love how society has shifted to that, that it's no longer the like, Oh, you have to be quiet. And we don't do that in hockey. And, you know, guys like myself and guys like Luke, you know, with his announcement, it becomes the, well, the, the naysayers or the, the trolls on Twitter, or the DM you or whatever, they're the ones that are wrong. It's not us that are living our truth. And I think that's the most important part. How important, just looking back, we talk about trailblazers in, in this aspect, in this conversation. Uh, Brendan Burke, obviously, was one of the first guys to come out. He came out while he was in college, ended up being you know, the, the reason why they started the You Can Play project. And, of course, unfortunately, he passed away in 2010 in the car accident. And Patrick ended up taking that, and, and, and as well as Brian and a few others, and, and basically trying to eradicate homophobia, homophobia in sports in general. Yeah, that was a big piece for me. I remember uh, where exactly I was. Brendan was only a year younger than me. He was an 88, I'm an 87. And I remember watching it on Sports Center with James Duffy there and saying, wow, this kid is going to trip. This kid is exactly like me. You know, we're the same age. I'd love to meet this guy one year, uh, you know, one day. And obviously, you know, tragically passed away. But I met with Brian before before my uh, big announcement. And I showed up three minutes late and he gave it to me for that. But uh <laughs> I went over for a, a, a couple beers. I, I just cold text him one day and said, Hey, I, I'd love to just pick your brain. He sent me his address right away in Toronto. I showed up and he said, Hey, I'm going to be on a zoom. So just make yourself at home in the backyard and grab a beer. So I was on a call. And so I showed, it was a five o'clock meeting. I showed up at five Oh three and he's sitting in the backyard watching the birds and goes, you're late. And I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> you told me not because there's a zoom on. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, okay. He's like, first rule. Don't be late. If you played for me, you'd be fired or traded. I'm like, Okay, well, good thing I'm just telling you I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> like, Berk, I'm just for, trying uh, to have a beer, dude. <laughs> yeah, seriously, he was bird watching, and I said, Berkey, that's a different type of bird watching, but yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good story. Yeah, oh shit. my. Uh, so when you when you talk about hockey Canada, that's an amazing job because every year in every tournament, Canada's the favorite. And it's just been like a powerhouse. You said world juniors, you said world championships. How did you begin there? What was your, what was your end to hockey Canada? Like how much did you have to work your way up to, to go where you were before you became an agent? Yeah. I, uh, Bob Nicholson actually, who was the president at the time introduced my parents. So he played beer league with my dad for, with my dad in Victoria and took my mom to prom in Penticton. Um, and he says he took her twice and I don't know who failed grade 12, Bob or my mom, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> So, Bob, I was in university in Calgary. I was 20 years old, entering my third year of university, and I, I sat Bob down. I remember going over to his house. My brother was playing for the Washington Capitals at the time, and I couldn't afford the, uh, the 20 bucks a month for center ice. So I went over to his house to watch my brother's games. And I said, hey, how do I get into Hockey Canada? I, I love the sport. I played it. You know, what, how, what do I got to do? And finally, I, har I think I harassed him enough that uh, he got me a job doing income tax receipts. Uh, he's like, sure. Just, I think he told HR, just give him something to do. So I went in during the day. I was taking night classes. And the first day I show up and they're like, hey, uh, I said, great, where's my office? They said, it's over here. It's the old ticket office. And it was a storage locker. So I had to empty it my first day. And then I started playing beer league hockey with the Bob Nicholson's, the Johnny Misley's, the, uh, the Brad Pascal's, the Scott Salmon's of the world. A job opened up uh, in player development. So Paul Carson, I, I was pretty much a glorified uh, hockey coach with a university degree for two years. My parents were phoning me saying, what are you doing? You, you got to get your life going here. You're, you're literally teaching Peewee kids crossovers and you've got a university degree. Like, let's get it going here, big boy. And then a job opened up with men's national teams. I was a coordinator. My first World Juniors was 2013 uh, in Edmonton or 2012 in Edmonton, Calgary. And then slowly moved up the ranks to be kind of the senior team service guy. So the lowest I would go would be World Juniors. So everything, Men's Worlds, World Cup of Hockey, Olympics, and 
you know, I owe, I owe everything to hockey Canada. It was, uh, the, the amount of people that I got to work with and meet and truly without them, I wouldn't be where I am today with the player relationships, which is what the agency world is. Um, but also the staff, you know, John Cooper is at world championships to, you know, I've had George McPhee to Brad tree living, you name it. Anyone that's come through Joel Quenville, Barry Trotz, uh, you name it, any player or anyone that's come through the senior program at hockey Canada, I've had the pleasure to work with. And I, I truly, that's how I learned was just, there's no, there's no law school or med school to be an agent, right? It's all relationships. So my school was being at hockey camp. That was my, my internship was, was going and you lose a gold medal game. You know, I remember sitting there crying in, in Malmo, Sweden. I'm like, Oh my God, we lost. And my boss came up and goes, Hey, at least we get another shot next year. You know, I'm like, but for the, <laughs> for the 19 year old players, they're crushed. Right? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. We're, we're, we're already fighting for next year, you know? So you get a couple shots a year. Oh my ace. Hey, oh, so it wasn't your junior B career that got you the job at hockey Canada. No, that was uh, short lived. Thank, thankfully, um, just quickly on that, I was playing for my hometown team, the Victoria Cougars. And we take warm up. Our coach at the time, who's a good friend of mine now, would make eight of us take warm up. And he wouldn't tell us. So we'd prepare all day and, uh, and then healthy scratch someone afterwards. So you're like, just tell me if I'm not playing. I was six foot four, 225 pounds. My brother was playing in the show, should be on the road, some sort of a minor league contract. And I actually, uh, the boys did fill the net and I actually toe picked and went into the end boards and knock myself out and they like rolled me over and I had the Paul Korea fog visor <laughs> and uh, the trainer came out was giving me the smelling salts in warm up, and uh, I get back in the room I'm on the trainer's table they're doing this flashlights in the eye and the coach comes in and goes Bader you're not going tonight and I'm like oh yeah really <laughs> oh shit so a after after that and uh, a few Western League offers, but all they wanted me to do was fight. Um, I said, you know what, guys, I'm going to get on the other side of the game and go to school. And it was uh, the best thing I ever did to join Hockey Canada. Now, you know, just got certified about six months ago with the NHLPA to, you know, be able to talk to GMs and negotiate my own deals. And, you know, it was the best thing I ever did. I still thank that coach. I said, thank God you didn't ring me along because I still would have been gutting it out the coast or somewhere. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just got to the, the young right age of 18 call it a career on the ice. In warmies. Jesus. So you didn't grow up dreaming of being an agent. You just kind of came a little, a little later, spur of the moment. Yeah, I always wanted to be in hockey. You know, I didn't know what path that was going to be. You know, I thought about being a lifer at Hockey Canada. Um, you know, not to sound you know, cocky or anything, but when you've done six world juniors, you're kind of like, okay, what's next? You know, you're kind of, everyone, I think it's human nature to always want to do something more. You know, you can win as many titles as you want, but you're like, okay, what's next? You know, and, and CAA came calling after uh, we got, we lost in the quarterfinals in 2019 in Vancouver to Finland. And um, I got a call the next day from Pat Persson and JP Berry saying, hey, let's go for dinner. And, you know, the rest is history. I grew up thinking you always had to go to law school or be a lawyer to be an agent, but obviously that's not true. What, what is the criteria to get certified by the NHLPA? What's that consist of? Uh, with the PA, they do a pretty deep like reference checks, uh, credit checks, uh, make sure you're not a criminal, make sure you're not, you know, everything. Sorry, you right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, it's not a, like a written exam or anything. They, they sit you down for an interview and, um, wow. you know, luckily – you know, by the time my interview came out, I was, uh, or by the time my interview came, I was already out of the closet. So I think they wanted uh, a gay agent and, you know, diversity. And it was kind of played in my favor. But um, yeah, it was, it was cool. And, you know, to, to be a certified agent is kind of a nice checklist, you know, in the, in the old, you know, Rolodex to say that, you know, I've done that. And I still have aspirations. I do miss, I do miss the team side of things, you know, the, the chasing a gold medal when you're, you're with the players and it's semifinals or it's a gold medal day and you get to know these group of players, but that's the, the good thing. And the bad thing about hockey Canada is that you never have the same team twice. It's not like you're going through a, an 82 game season and it's like, okay, you know what, we'll, we'll, we can lose 10 and we will, we'll still be fine. Someone may get traded or, Hey, see you guys next year at the locker room clean out. When you do a 30 day tournament, whether it's a world's and under 18s, a, world cup of hockey you'll never have that same group together again and that was the special part of like you have you know some continual pieces like a, a ryan o'reilly or a, a Braden shen that came every year to men's worlds when they weren't in the playoffs so they were the they were the staples the i remember o'reilly would send me a text in february and say where are we going this year you know that type of thing 
But, that's when uh, he was with the Sabres. Yeah, that's when, Shots winning, fired, wasn't very, that's, that's when <laughs> yeah. winning wasn't very fun with the Sabres. But, um, you know, those are those are the special times. You look back at the the tournaments and the, you, you think, oh, who was the coach there? And well, who was our who was our captain? And, yeah. you know, they all kind of blend together. And uh, I see Whit, you've got your Olympic, uh, you know, thing there. And it's one of those. Yeah, ones silver that, medal. You know that. Was that uh, Vancouver? Yeah tough one i was Very i was at the roxy one. watching that game in a ski suit for one piece so <laughs> oh so you weren't so you weren't working yet yeah because you said i think 2012 no. right so uh yeah back, going back to your first experience at world juniors who were the young guys then that you were getting to know yeah my first one was uh 2012 we had like shifley dougie hamilton it was in edmonton calgary they were the returnees Strom, uh Vicentine, uh harrington those were the guys. And then I kind of came up through the ranks, like through, you, you know, you 18s through twenties through worlds was, you know, the McDavid's, the Reinhardt's, the Domi's, the Darnell nurse, you know, and it's interesting when you, you have them at U 18s and it's like, boys, no alcohol, no nothing. If I see you with anything, a chew, you're done. You know, and then we go to a men's worlds and it's like beers in the locker room. It's actually encouraged. And you're like, Vader, I just played world juniors this year. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, like, it's, I got it's, everything set up in the room, guys. It's all set. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, completely go, different. You go from being go from, like basically yeah. the teacher to then all of a sudden you're the you're, you're the morale guy trying to line things up even for like the bars in town. Yeah, World Juniors, you go from like Normatex and protein shakes in the stall to Men's Worlds. You go, there's a bottle of rum and a cold beer waiting for you and a slice of pizza. That's the post game. So, of course, so you, getting to know these guys pretty closely. Uh, I, I know one story, the 2015 in Prague, after you guys ended up winning gold, I'll let you take over from here. Yeah, that was a that was a good one. We had a dream team that year. Sid came over. Uh, we were in Vienna for pre-comp, and we had a, you know, we had Bernsey, we had uh, Sagan, you know, we had, a, we had a Giroux, we had a really good team. And then Sid lost out, and uh, I think, I don't know who it was to, maybe the Islanders or something, and I got a phone call saying, hey, Sid wants to come over. And I said, you guys are joking, right? Sid doesn't, why would Sid want to come over? Like, we're, in, we're going to Prague. And he goes, no, he wants to come and complete the Triple Gold Club. He doesn't have a world championship yet. And we're like, okay. So sure enough, Sid comes over. I roomed him with Giroux just because I wanted to see them after those battles. I said, yeah. hey, <laughs> we picked him up at the airport, and I said, you're rooming with G. He goes, really? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> as soon as Sid came over, as soon as Sid came over, it turned into, as you know, Wit, you know, you know, as soon as Sid comes in the mix and he goes, I'm chasing triple gold, the boys kind of tighten it up a bit. But you look back at that roster, our, our young guys were like Nate McKinnon was, you know, on the bottom pair, um, you know, Schenner, uh, Burnsy, Ham Hughes, Barry, trying to think there. But so when uh, we went out to the bars and they had this diplomatical rum, this awesome rum and Burnsy loved it. Bernsey and Jake Muzzin were like all over it. So we're heading, we're nine and oh, we were rolling through the tournament. We beat the checks in check, like something crazy. Like the boys were dominating and there was actually a bonus that year. Some insurance company put up, if, if you sweep the table and go 10 and oh, you get a million dollar bonus. So we were like eight and oh, and then we went to the semis and, uh, and then we, we match up with Russia in the finals. And so we're nine and oh, and I'm like, boys, before the game, I'm like, you get a million bucks on this game. Right. So we go, Bernsey comes up to me on the morning skate. He goes, Hey, Boehner, we're going to win this one. Can you go get a case of diplomatical rum and put a bottle in every guy's stall? I'm like, sure, sure. That's kind of a weird request for the team service guy, but I'll go get a bottle of rum for every guy. And so we go, we win and we spank Russia in the final. It's the least stressful gold medal game I've ever been a part of. I think, you know, we were, I think at one point in the tournament in the round robin, we were down like three, nothing to, uh, to Sweden after like one. Todd McClellan came in and goes like after one, he goes, I'll bag skate you guys. If you guys don't turn this around and they just turned it on and we won like six, three or something like, they're like, we don't want to get bag skated. Like, sure boys, like let's get out there. So anyways, after the game, um, there's nowhere to go in Prague. So we just sat in the locker room till about 2 AM had the trophy in there, the cigars going. The, obviously everyone had a personal bottle of rum. And uh, as you can imagine, the pirates come out and there was a bit of a slip and slide set up. Uh, throughout the throughout the locker room, and uh, a few of the players started going, and then all of a sudden the Vayner chant started, and I'm in a suit. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't know. We just swept the table. We got the big bonus check. Like it was like a, the golfers tournament checks, you know, like yeah, the Waterbury like Open. Right? <laughs> yeah, Sid had to go up and like get this check, and we had this massive check in the room for a million dollars. And he's like, do we take this on the plane home? 
so the the Boehner chant started, and um, yeah, I'm I'm I easily give in to peer pressure, so I uh, <laughs> geared down and uh, slipped through uh, Brent Burns' legs after going in the shower and grabbing the trophy, and it was. <laughs> I remember I came to the hotel, my suit was all soaked in beer and champagne, and finally the families were waiting for us. I I didn't realize that that the families were waiting up for us at the hotel, and we did about a three hour celebration in the locker room after. What do you mean? There's nowhere to go in Prague. Not on that night. It was a Monday night, and we oh, had the so families just, all set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just more as low you know, key celebration. World, as you know, World Championships. There's about the two weeks before, and then Team Canada of the round robin, and then Team Canada actually brings the families in for the last week. So it's it's tighten up time. You know, yeah, guys are like, re guys are like, hey, guys see at the rink only. <laughs> yeah, guys are guys are reintroducing themselves, asking for room changes. It's uh, you know, it, everyone gets pretty serious once the families come over. Did um, you have any uh, trips? I mean, you must have had a bunch to Russia, World Juniors, World Championships. Oof, World Championships. That was probably my favorite team and our captain. It was just a workhorse team in 26. So after Prague, we went to Russia. And where we did our pre-comp was back to Prague before Russia. So we were like, we went back there because the guys had so much fun the year before. So like O'Rai and Shenner and them were like, well, we got to go back to Prague. You know, it's a reunion tour. So we went back for like four days, played the checks in an exhibition game and Corey Perry got knocked out of the playoffs and he calls and goes, uh, I want to come over. I want to chase the triple gold club. Like Sid did last year. He goes, there's one problem. I don't have a passport. I go, sorry, that's going to be tough to get you over to Prague and then into Russia. So he actually drove up to LA to the embassy, got like a custom, like three month passport that he got literally within like half an hour at the embassy. It was like a white label. It's like something I've never seen. He showed up to Prague and wanted to play that night. He flew over, landed at like 5 p.m. And we were playing the checks and Paris was like, I'm ready to go. We're like, Paris, you just flew for 14 hours. You're not playing tonight. Like, we've got enough bodies. He's taking warm up, yelling at us. He's like, I'm good, boys. Let's go. Let's go. And so we uh, head back to, we, we, after that, we head into Russia. And you guys know Russia is just, it's the Wild West. It is from a, especially in my role at the time, team services, you try and set stuff up and it is, jungle rules like it is yes yes mr pettinger we'll, we have it set up for you you know and then you show up and there's no meal and you're like what were what, like what do you mean i was like they're like small problem no meal you're they like, go that's what? russia like, <laughs> yeah and you're just small like, problem oh, okay it's russia. but throughout that whole tournament it was just a it was a workhorse team you know we had marshy we had gallagher we had you know domi um i'm trying to think connor came he was a young buck there because that was after his injured season um, when he slid into the boards there. So he had only played like 50 games or something in the league. And then he came over as a young buck. Um, and we had Morgan Riley, Reinhardt, uh, I'm trying to think they all kind of blend together, but yeah, Russia in general, I got one story there where, so we <laughs> Russia. if you ever been to St. Petersburg, it's all islands, right? So it's all like little, like it's all bridges over to little islands. So it's not like it's a actually unreal league. too. Oh, St. Petersburg is one Sick. of the most beautiful cities I've ever been to. And we were there in the springtime. It was unbelievable. We, I, I, as my role with team services, the boys are like, well, Boehner, you got to set up something for the fellas. You know, we got to see what Russia is all about. So I'm like, okay, okay. Then they're like, but we've heard about these bridges that go up, you know, on the islands. Like they literally, like if this is connecting in our hotels here and the, and the, the nightclubs over here, between certain hours, they just, because the shipping channels are right downtown. So the city was built out but it's so archaic that they have to have these bridges up for certain hours. So they're like, Boehner, make sure you make sure you check out what time the bridges go up. We don't want to get stranded at the bar. I'm like, I'm on it guys. You got the right guy on the case here. And so I go and I'm like, yeah, from two to five, 2 AM to 5 AM, the bridges are up. So if we're at the nightclub between those hours, we're going to be stranded till 5 AM. So they're like, you sure? I'm like, yep. I double checked it with our team host. I, I you know, I, I verified it. So we go out after a game, we had the next day off. So um, we get the team bus and I'm like, boys, it's not, man it, you know, it is mandatory. So guys, even that weren't drinking, like I remember Brad Marchand did his shoulder or something and he's like, Hey, I'm on painkiller. So I can't, I can't drink, but I'd like to be out with the boys. Are you sure the bridges go up at 2 a.m.? I'm like hundred percent Marshy. I got you. So we go <laughs> to the nightclub, me and our team security guy. And it's like 140. we're running through the nightclub. Guys are paying bottle service. And I'm like, boys, we've got to make the bridge load up on the team bus. So we're, we're guys are, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of females in the mix. And uh, sure enough, we get everyone on the bus at like 150. And I'm like, okay, hey, we're good. Show up to the bridge at 155. 
up. And I'm like, what, like, what do you mean here? They're like, yeah, we just decided to do it early. I'm like, so now I have the whole team chirping me saying, Oh, Vayner, I thought like you cleared us out of there. Like it was last call, like ugly lights on. And now we're sitting at this bridge and some guys are like, should we swim? And I'm like, no, we're not swimming across the St. Petersburg river. And so we, we came to a conclusion. I said, well, boys, we got two options. We can sit here and everyone can pass out on the bus or that nightclub was pretty good. And we could go back there till 5. AM. So we, we put the team bus back right out to the nightclub, loaded back in guys just slid right into their pockets of bottle service. And we stayed till the sun came up and walked in uh, right for team breakfast. And the, the GM, I think it was tree and tree living and George McPhee were looking at us like, you guys just out for a morning walk and we're like yep just checking out the sites the whole team pulls up and walks right in for breakfast it was hilarious going to see the bridge oh but uh, from that from that our coach at the time who was billy peters got asked about it in the media the next day and so we had the day off so he heard he, he gets uh asked in the media they go i heard team canada run into some trouble with the bridges and billy goes Sorry, I don't speak Russian and just didn't answer the question. <laughs> it was blatantly in English. Just completely <laughs> dodged it. Uh, what, but it turned, it, a- it turned in, it turned in, just to wrap that, it turned into a bit of a team slogan. And I went and got a painting of Bridges Up and we put it in the trainer's room. And then when we won that year, we beat uh, Finland in the final. Our rings actually um, have bridges on it from St. Petersburg. So it became a bit of a, a team motto for the Bridges Up. And still, any, anyone that I see from that team, you know remembers the bridges i think the next day the management went out and said we don't believe you and they they got caught too so i said boys i'm not i'm not tell, i'm not lying here the bridges go up at a certain time we don't know when <laughs> um did you uh, end up doing any high kicking on these trips because i was talking to jeff cullen before this one of our uh, local buddies from victoria and he was reminding me some of your antics our antics in order to create the morale and one thing you're famous for um and and you end up ruining a few pairs of designer jeans a year is your high kicks Yes, I've done uh, eight stampedes in my day when I lived in Calgary for Hockey Canada. So the Wranglers aren't exactly the most flexible jeans. Um, Biz, I've actually done a few stampedes with you. So let's be careful what road we go down here. But um, yeah, I, I've been known to uh, stretch the hamstrings a bit. And uh, there was actually one time at Cowboys where the boys, I think Benny, Jamie, Ben, and a few of the boys were in town. And, um, you know, things were, it was a bit of a day fade. And the bouncer came up and said, hey, you guys got to tone it down here. And I just asked him, I said, hey, put your hand as high as you can. Like, so he's, this is like this big bouncer. And he's like this. And I go, if I kick it, we get to stay. You can't kick us out. And he goes, okay, sure. That's fair. There's no way you're going to kick my foot. They're like standing here. I'm a six foot four guy. So I go, I stretch it out, do the whole warm up. You know, like I'm like uh, with that Jimenez there on the green, just warming up the hammies. And I go and I high kick it. And he's like, you guys can stay like perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, the Ben from Ben boys from the iron as well. Uh, who's, who's the crazier one of the two? Ooh, depends what day I would say. Jamie's Jordan's under the radar. He's very Jamie's under, under the, radar. the radar. Jamie, if you get him around, you know, he's a lot like Connor and them. If you get him around people that he trusts for sure. Jordy's got a kid now. I would say Jamie for sure, but Tyson Berry, you talk about Island Boys, Tyson would definitely lead that charge for us. And uh, all three of them are my clients. So it's awesome though. It all ties back, right? Like when I first got certified, I asked those three as my close friends. I said, hey, will you guys leave your agents and and come with me and help me start my book and my career? And all three of them were non-hesitant. I want to come with you, Boehner, and I want to help support you and get your feet off the ground. And Right now, I'm, you know, with Tyson and with Jordy, they're both UFAs, so trying to get them jobs. So they just go, okay, it was all nice when I committed to you. Now get me some work. <laughs> What's the most exaggerated, like, uh, stereotype of an agent? Of course, everyone watches Entourage. She's Ari Gold. Like, uh, are there that many shocks in the water as people think in the agent field? Yeah, I think that I watched, I actually watched it on a plane yesterday, Jerry Maguire. I said, I haven't oh, seen this I, I almost said that earlier, yeah. Great flip. Yeah, Jerry Maguire, just like, you know, the – the cockiness, you know, and that's what I'm trying to change a bit is be a bit more relatable to the guys, you know, be a bit more their friend. It doesn't have to be just talk when the contract's up, you know, and I, I'm more of the less is more actually get involved with their lives. And, you know, it's more than just taking your commission when the contract's up. And I, that's what I'm trying to kind of change is be more of a friend. You know, like I look at it as like a real estate agent, you know, everyone has a choice in who their medical doctor is, who their real estate agent is, there doesn't have to be this animosity amongst agents. It's all the player's choice. You know, the market's going to set the deal. You know, it's not like I'm going to come in and all of a sudden get 
Jordy Ben $10 million next year. You know, it's going to be the market sets that. It's, it's whoever the player is comfortable with. And, you know, I'm leaning on my past relationships with, with players through Hockey Canada to, um, to try and gain more clients, you know, because I think that's important because some guys think, you know, agents are kind of stiff and, you know, the Jerry Maguire stereotype, you know, and I'm just trying to break that down and be more of a, just a, a buddy, you know, that can, can manage your business and manage your brand and not just talk when you're, your contract's up and, and take your points and, and run. When you say brand too, it's so different now with Instagram and how many different people or how many different ways people can get paid. How, how, how different it is for you trying to learn on the fly? Like, all right, we can really make money away from the game. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, you know, as I said earlier, the contracts kind of set themselves. You know, how many yeah. points did you have? What's your age? What's your injury status? You could give a range. Hey, we may get an extra signing bonus in there. We may get an extra year. But really the difference maker is, is the endorsements. You know, what, what can we do? It depends what market you're in, obviously, here. You know, but here we've got Morgan Riley, you know, John Tavares in a, in a, in a Toronto market. You know, is it that easy to get those guys deals in Columbus? No. But you got to play, and that's I think that's the difference maker for for all agencies is what can you because we're cold calling companies, right? Whether it's Gatorade or you know Acura or you name it, guys want car deals. You know, uh, uh, with the, the 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 richer they get, the more free stuff they want, right? So <laughs> it's uh, it's hilarious that way that you know, uh, and that's our job is to you know whether it's a Lulu sponsorship or you know uh, you know uh, I, I bring deals to clients all the time and sometimes they laugh it off i remember i had a shawarma deal and you know for for a couple grand and the What's player a said, not, is that a, is that a burrito of, yeah one of those like middle eastern like you know like the shave off the stick things and i was like for all who? you got to do is it was for, for morgan riley <laughs> and he's like you i'm, I'm not he's like i'm not really a shawarma guy i'm like i don't really care if you're a shawarma guy just take it <laughs> Hey, I'll be a former guy. Yeah, Biz. I said for that. Biz will take that. Yeah, Biz, you waited down said, New York last month. <laughs> oh, oh for that, you should. Yeah, R.A. brought me there at about 4 a.m. in the morning. That was delicious. <laughs> Mind you, at that point, I don't think I had taste buds. But, uh, oh, man, that's that's good stuff. Hey, so, so uh, that, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, going back to Russia, I, I think, well, Whit, you were in Sochi and, and you were as well, right? How was that yeah. whole experience getting there? Like, that was – some of the places weren't even ready yet. Yeah, so I've been to Sochi four times, actually. I was there for a test event before. San Diego of Russia? It is the San Diego of Russia. It is extremely tropical. People, like, think that you're going to, like, Moscow where it's all gray. Like, it it was T-shirt and the Olympics, T-shirt and shorts, uh, palm trees. Like, honestly, it was like San Diego. And uh, so I went, I was pretty lucky. I went there for U18 um, in 2013, which was a test event for the Olympics. And we won and we never win that tournament because that's the tournament that um, is only players out of the CHL playoffs. Right. So we are kind of a riffraff team. We're like, Oh, if you get knocked out, come and it's the U S program, full-time program. That's their like Stanley cup final. So U S had won like five in a row, but we went over there. We had a bit of a secret weapon with a double underage named Connor McDavid that came in and had back to back hat tricks and absolutely tore through the tournament. And that was kind of his hockey Canada coming out party. And uh, I remember like walking to the rink and it was like, literally it was just a rink. That was it. Like there was like dirt around it and like stray dogs. And then when I came back a year later for the actual Olympics and it's now like where the stray dogs were is now like a security tent and there's an F1 track going around. And I'm like, what is going on here? Right. It's it's just like the, the amount of money that they threw into it. When I left there in April for, and the Olympics for 10 months later, I said, there's no way they're going to be ready. Like, there was literally the security was a, it looked like a puppy. We're like, I don't even know if that thing sniffs drugs or what it does or just greets people. And uh, so we went back for obviously for the Olympics and it was like full on. And then I went back a year later um, for a trial for the, or a couple of years later for when we had that non uh, pro Olympic team. So we were trying to find players in the KHL and we started with an August tournament in Sochi. And there was a, the F1 track where the entrance was. They turned it into a complete amusement park. And uh, it was crazy to see, like, the lead up before the Olympics, the actual Olympics, and then a couple of years after, the Olympic Village, they turned into restaurants. And, you know, there was some stuff that was abandoned. And I had heard they were packing up one of the rinks, like the women's venue, and just literally de-piecing it and moving it to Moscow. And I'm, Yeah, we're I, doing I that with know. the Coyotes facility. We're going to move it from yeah. Glendale to uh, Scottsdale. <laughs> Me and Witt talked about the game plan, putting on a truck and wheeling it over. It should be right downtown Scottsdale, real close to the W there, just so you can roll out of there. 
a uh, when you would go to these tournaments, would you have to room with anyone? Because I've seen videos of you snoring. And let's let's roll the oh, clip for everybody. This. That's this is not That's normal. Soaring. <laughs> you guys have that? Let's let's roll the clip, folks. Now explain that, Boehner. Like what? Like what's happening there? Tell me you had four hundred drinks. I won't. I <laughs> yeah. won't snow a shame. That's why they that call you is- Elephant Liver. That's what Di- Ellie actually- was digging up. We actually put that uh, on the team bus heading to the game the next day and had the guys guess what that was. We're like, guys, what do you think this sound is? And guys like came up with suggestions. They're like, it's a dying sea lion. It's a, uh, you know, it's an elephant that just got shot with a dart gun. It is like, I don't know. That was one of the uh, Ryan O'Reilly um, guitar nights where at Men's Worlds, we were in Herning or Silkenberg, Denmark. And there was nothing to do in Silkenberg, Denmark. And Ryan O'Reilly, this was about his fifth worlds in a row and we're in Denmark and he buys a, one thing about Ori, he's other than being the coolest human I've ever met. Um, the factor, he is literally the nicest and coolest human I've ever met. And I mean he's that John with all Mary sincerity. Yeah. He buys, so every world he bought a guitar. So the first thing when we get to Paris or we get to Denmark or, you know, Prague or St. Pete's, he, he asked me, he said, where's the nearest guitar shop? I want to go and buy like a Fender or, something to have a souvenir. So I'm sure the guy has hundreds of guitars. So that was one of those nights we were in Denmark and he was just plucking away, singing. And, you know, those, those little moments where you, you kind of have to pinch yourself that Ryan O'Reilly is serenading you with a tune. And um, I think I had a couple glasses of wine that night and uh, O'Reilly decided to bring out his, his phone and film me snoring there, which is now uh, quite epic around the hockey world. Oh my goodness. Can he shred it off? Ryan- oh yeah. O'Reilly can play. So I, hey, I got a here. random question, but you're so dialed in with Hockey Canada. And it just reminded me when you mentioned McDavid came in as a young underage or under 18. I saw that Connor Bedard and you've moved on. You're in the agent. But how about this kid? Is he like, is everyone within Hockey Canada now saying he's like the next one? Yeah, I actually went down once we went into a third lockdown here. I don't do well in lockdown. So I, I'm a bit of a, I don't know if you can tell, a social butterfly. So I, once Toronto announced a third lockdown, I said, I'm getting out of here. And I phoned Benny and asked him if I could come down and stay with him. And he said, yeah, you got six bedrooms to choose from. He's got a seven bedroom shack with only him in there. So I went down there and, and oddly enough, under 18s was on there uh, in Plano, Texas while I was there. So I got to go, all the scouts were down there. Everyone was down there in April. Um, remember when women's worlds got canceled and they were talking about moving it all to Texas because the under 18s were there. So I phoned my bosses and I said, Hey, we're heading into another lockdown here. Do you mind if I go down to Texas for the month? I got both vaccines down there and then went to all the team Canada games and was back in a rink having coffee. And it was like normal world in Texas. And um, yeah, it was great. But that Bedard, he's a player. He, uh, he's nasty. I, I look forward to seeing him and just the next prop, you know, Shane Wright, you know, and those are guys, I never worked with them in hockey Canada. My kind of era was the, you know, McDavid's Reinhardt's those guys, Morgan Riley and, you know, it's it's funny to see when you have guys at under 18s, world juniors, world championships, and now if you know, hopefully, knock on wood, they go to the Olympics here to see, you know, how many guys that I've worked with there from when they started. You know, it's it's funny to see the progression there. But as far as Bedard, I, I just look forward to to seeing what he can bring there. And you know, he, did, he I think in that bubble in the dub there, he had unbelievable numbers and was pretty nasty down in Texas there. So I, I really look forward to seeing what he can bring to the Hockey Canada table and hopefully get some. Some more golds because it's been t- tough to come by the the whole hockey USA, world is bud. We're, we're, yeah. We just keep coming and coming, and that sounds ridiculous, but we keep coming. That was that was one of the hardest parts when I switched over to the agency. Was I was so ingrained in my mind that the Swedes and the Americans are the enemies, 
And now they're clients, <laughs> you know, like Jack, I remember I did world juniors and it was Jack and Quinn in Vancouver. And I was like, Oh, we can't talk to them. And then I got hired by CAA and Jim Hughes works for us. He's like our player development guy. And then, you know, I'm meeting Jack and Quinn and getting to know them and going to their house. And I'm like, these guys aren't that bad. Maybe the Canadian, you know, the, the maybe they are some friends, you know? So it's letting down that, that Canadian guard when you work at hockey Canada for 10 years and you just have it ingrained in you, but you know, worldwide, there's some amazing players and, you know, it's, it's great to see, you know, the game and, you know, what Germany's doing and what, you know, the Great Britain, even at the last men's worlds and just how the hockey world is kind of coming along. And it's not just, you know, Canada, USA or Canada, Russia that, you know, I think there was something that, you know, it has been five different world juniors winners over the last five years, which goes to show you the, the, the level of competition and where it's come from. Team Canada needs the land orca back in the for the morale. <laughs> the high land kick. Orca. We're, we're bringing back the high kick for the Olympics to open up the ceremonies. <laughs> yeah, we need those. We need. You're gonna be uh, carrying the something. flag doing the high kick. <laughs> yeah, something's wrong. Something they need some morale because it's getting too static. Bane, I, I read that you played rugby, and right now you 100 look like a rugger with the hat on backwards and the hair coming out. But how crazy is rugby culture? The songs, shoot the boot, all that wild stuff. You must have took part in all that shit. Yeah, it's crazy that the two sports I picked uh, also involved heavy drinking. But um, <laughs> other than that, no, rugby was awesome. I went to high school in, in Oak Bay on the West Coast there uh, in Victoria, where it was seasonal and kind of the Rugby Canada headquarters. So when I showed up in, at grade eight as 6'3", 200 pounds, I didn't really have the option to not play. So, um, you know, played in high school, luckily enough, played for Team Canada. Um, we were in Dubai for a U-20 World Championships, which is like the equivalent of a World Juniors got to play, um, you know, in a world champion Dubai. We played our games at 10 at night because it was so hot over there. Um, and that was when, you know, 2006 Dubai was booming. You know, I went to that little man-made island there. I remember, you know, the palm tree. I remember taking a boat tour out there, going up to that that tower or that hotel that's shaped like a sail, um, you know, where Tiger hit drives off of. But, yeah, my, my rugby days were, uh, you know, they were awesome. Uh, the camaraderie is very similar to hockey. You know, you're, it's kind of next man up you know, check your ego at the door, um, you know, really put your body on the line for your teammates. Um, and even, you know, thinking here, uh, some of the guys I played with are now going to be at the Tokyo Olympics here starting on Sunday. So some of the guys I did some rugby Canada stuff with, so it's cool to see the, the two sports and actually in, in, um, in 2016 or 2017, we were in Paris for world championships and, uh, the rugby sevens was on at the same time. So I, uh, the manager for the rugby sevens team said, Hey, why don't we, come to a team Canada game. And I actually linked it up that the rugby Canada guys came down to the locker room after. So we've got Mitch Marner, Ryan O'Reilly, and you know, some of the, the top Canadian rugby players, we sat in the locker room for a couple hours and just had some beers and exchanged stories. But, you know, it was a huge thrill for the, obviously the rugby guys, but also for the team Canada hockey guys to, you know, I think it's, it's almost like musicians and, and hockey players. They, 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 um, you know, idolize each other. And I think it's a unique kind of relationship that way with other pro athletes that, you know, they, they can bounce ideas off each other and training and, and all that. So it was cool that those kind of my, my rugby and my, and my hockey worlds kind of collided in Paris there. And uh, we were able to get them together for, uh, for a quick hot stove down in the locker room. I had yep. no clue about rugby guys. And then I, I met all these guys from Victoria. And next thing you know, we're throwing a party, 40 dudes. We called it El Mass. We got one guy butt chugging vodka. It like, it, savagery. no, it savagery, man. Savagery. I, was, I live next to them up school. Absolute savagery. My front lawn every other day. Do you ever shoot the boot, Bane? Oh yeah. I played. Uh, so <laughs> after high school, I went, I actually went to Wales and played semi-pro and uh, like rugby. It was like cheap money, but I, I needed to train somewhere. And I, I remember we were in Cardiff playing a game and it was like, Oh, Boehner, you're not, you're not going to get in. Like, don't worry. The, uh, like my team was, I was way out of my weight class for the level of rugby I was playing. They're like, you're going to sub. If someone gets hurt. You'll go in. So our guy goes first play of the game gets, takes a hit, knocked out. They're like, Hey kid, you're in. I'm 19 playing in this like men's league. And I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> so I go, I take a run off the scrum half and I go in this big Welsh prop and he lifts me up and just sees my nose off. And I'm like, nose connected to my ear. And I'm like, what? It starts a line brawl. Cause my team was like, Oh, you can't touch the Canadian kids like that. And uh, sure enough, after the game, he goes, Hey, I really, the Welsh guy comes up in a horrid accent. Hey, I really shouldn't have done that. Let me go buy you a pint. And I'm like, well, why did you do that? Like, I'm literally, I got like gauze up my nose. I'm like, was that necessary? But then right after it's as soon as the game's done, it's like, both teams go to the same bar, 
you tell stories, oh, that was a dirty hit on me, you know, and, and it's just, you know, sometimes hockey's like that, um, you know, but rugby for sure, the camaraderie is just, it's second to none, and it's a, it's a fantastic game. I, I consider it the NFL without the pads and uh, longer, longer plays. There's no 15-second breaks and two minutes of commercials. But uh, going back to the prospects, we talked about uh, Shane Wright and uh, Bedard. Who are some of the undercover guys in this draft? Because when this episode comes out, it would have already happened. Who are some of the players that we should be looking for? Is this a CAA plug? or uh, Yeah, let's guys? talk about some <laughs> of the <laughs> CAA guys. <laughs> Uh, Carson Lambos, a D-man out of Winnipeg that had a bit of a, a medical uh, issue, so he wasn't able to play at U18s. I think he's going to slide a bit, but he's a mean D-man out of the Western League. Um, we could, you know, without bragging, we could have four or five of the top ten with CAA, which is unheard of for an agency, between uh, Beneers and, and uh, Power and Luke Hughes, the third Hughes brother. Um, you know, so we... We as an agency, you know, it, it's great to see because you meet these kids when they're young and, you know, 14, 15 year olds. I know you talk with Coop, it, it blows my mind how young we have to recruit sometimes. It's one of the things that I don't really love about the game and especially here in Toronto with the GTHL. Um, Sweden has it right that Sweden has a law uh, through Swedish ice hockey that you can't talk to a kid until January 1st of a 16 year old year for representation. And I think that's fantastic. And we should push that with the NHLPA. Because I'll get tips from someone will call me and say, hey, Vayner, you got to see this 09. And I'm like, an 09? I'm like, come on. Like, guys, yeah, that's the little Johnny's 11 years old. I, like, who knows if he's going to be six foot four or a player? Like, they're like, oh, yeah, he's, you yeah, know. Yeah, Bud Kilmer uh, shooting him up before a tight tournament. Fucking get out there, kid. <laughs> yeah, he's 5'2", 90 pounds. I'm like, don't <laughs> tell me those stats. <laughs> <laughs> But I wish, I wish we followed, in all seriousness, I wish we followed Sweden's lead and, uh, you know, uh, put in some regulations around that. Like NCAA, you know, NCAA, you can't approach They just changed it a little bit, right? They made it a, a yeah. different rule. Yeah, but how the NCAA does it where you can't approach a player until a certain age range or something, I think we should do the same for, for agencies because I'll go up and see a 13-year-old at a, at a game and he'll be, like, I'll be like, hey, guys, hand out a business card. And it's a lot of... Hey, who's that parent? And I go and introduce myself and it's like, Oh, we've been talking to someone for two years. I'm like, you've had an advisor or an agent since you're 11. I'm like, what have they done for you between novice Peewee and Bantam? Like, come on, you know? So well, that's one thing that I would love to see changed. And I think it's got to, you know, Paperson and JP are really pushing it with the NHLPA to, to get that in there because it is, you know, one of the, one of the things of the job that I don't like with how young we recruit. And, and what was happening with college too, is, you know, the guys don't necessarily, um, develop the way you, you thought they would, right? And like there were scholarships being taken away. And the other thing for you is, it's true. Like, what if the kid ends up, you know, at, at sixteen instead of thirteen? He's kind of taking a step back. So I think that'd be a great rule to to actually go into effect. Yeah. Well, think about how many late bloomers. Like I played with guys that were sick yeah. at novice, and you're like, you know, now they're pumping gas, and it's like, you know, and then a, a player that goes and plays you know, undrafted or a Jamie Ben that goes in the fifth round, you know, drafted out of junior A and wins an Art Ross and an Olympic gold medal. Like, how are you for us to play in the projection game? And, and especially in the agency world, I'm not trying to project if you're going to be a, you know, one step is to be a good junior player. I'm trying to project if you're going to be a pro, right? Because I don't collect a paycheck until a pro deal is signed. So like for me to predict at age 12 or 13, is this kid going to play in the show? It's extremely hard to do. Yeah, that's fucking crazy. Anything that we didn't co cover that you want to tell? I mean, you got tons of stories in the vault. I, we don't need to get anybody in trouble, but in, in, anyone that we didn't bring up? No, I think we're good. Like, as long as you guys are, I think it's been awesome. I hope, yeah. uh, you it's know, I didn't, great, I didn't. It's been great, Bane. No joke. Yeah. I, I think it's awesome. I didn't bury anyone. I want to make sure that we're, we're <laughs> making sure that, that the Luke Prokop thing is the real reason for yeah. it and that we're giving him the respect he deserves and, you know, maybe just on that, like the outreach that I've seen from the NHL, you know, the team social media and from, you know, everyone. And the biggest thing for me that I've learned not to go back to that and get all serious, but is, is humanizing it. Right. And I think that's the biggest thing. If, if you can tie to someone, if you don't tie to a cause, it's, it's an eye in the sky, right? If you, if you, if you say, Oh, that's great. We, you know, let's donate to breast cancer. If you haven't ever had someone affected by it, then I don't think that you're that t tied to it, right? Whereas 
like now me on this pod, you know, people go, okay, you know, I didn't know, I don't know anyone that's gay. So I still make gay jokes. You know, oh, that's so gay. So it's like, well, what do you mean by that? You know? And I, and I found that through my journey, I'm, I'm now educating my clients, you know, my clients, parents, my coworkers, my buddies, I don't have to be the language police at all times of being like, Hey, we don't, we don't say the F bomb here, you know? And I think once you can put a face to it, so, you know, say you guys hear something, you know, Biz, you reached out to me when my story came out and, you know, now maybe when you hear something, you go, hey, what, what do you mean by that? There's a lot of other words to say that that's brutal than saying, oh, that's so gay. You know, and now maybe with Luke, you know, maybe someone goes, maybe they're a Nashville Predators fan or someone in the locker room or I don't know. But now you can say, okay, there's a player that's gay. You know, here's an agent that's gay. And if you can put a face to it and humanize it, then it's not just a, a shot in the dark and it's not just a, a pipe dream. You know what I mean? One of the comments in the athletic article, you said for about 10 years, you were one foot in, one foot out. And the reason why I wanted to bring in the podcast, not because of all these amazing stories and what you've accomplished in the hockey world, but because of like this like internal struggle you were going through. And like, there could be people who are listening to this podcast who are dealing with the same thing where maybe they feel like they're, you know, maybe they're tied into sports where they feel that it's not going to be as accepted, where you saw the outpouring of support that not only that Luke got, but that you got, uh, is it Scott MacArthur, another another one yeah he works for Sportsnet up here he's a radio host of Leafs uh, Leafs morning and stuff so yeah and 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 he ended up coming out before you and I'm just like d- did he help with with the fact that you ended up coming forward as well and and even other people before you yeah I remember sitting here and watching watching his story come out on Twitter and you know it wasn't till my move to Toronto that I got out of Calgary kind of the you know, the cowboy wild west town of uh, thinking I had everything sorted out and I could just bury these emotions. It wasn't until I came to Toronto and saw a real diverse city and you walk down King Street or Church Street and there's, you see the whole spectrum and it's awesome that everyone just really doesn't care, you know? And in my story, it's just, you know, we're always taught in, in the hockey world to, to, you know, suck it up. And the team is bigger. You don't bring your issues to the rink, right? You don't, you're having a tough time with your wife, your, your, your knees sore. Well, you know what, suck it up buttercup and you got to get out there because what's more important is the team. And I think that that was ingrained in me at a young age, but it's okay to be an individual within the team. And, you know, we're always taught to, you know, it's the logo on the front, not the name on the back, which is fine. But at the same time, when you do, and this is what I told Luke, you know, when you do come to the realization that you want to, you know, be self quote unquote selfish and worry about yourself, you really have to stop giving two shits about what other people think of you. And that's where I, you know, really hit a point during COVID where I just said, you know, and always my, my, my point, my not coming out was, well, what if, what if, what if, what if, and it was all what ifs. And you have to have a point where you just stop giving two shits and you go, I'm going to worry about me and my happiness and find a partner. And if someone does have a problem with it, that's their problem. And you have to kind of put yourself first, which in hockey, we're not taught to do that. Right. We're taught to say you're, you're one of 23 players, get in line, suck it up. You know, we don't bring emotions. We don't bring personal life into this, but it's, it's okay to, to be an individual and, and be your true self. And, you know, I, I always say, I said, Biz, you don't walk into a room and say, hey, I'm Paul and I'm, I'm straight and have a girlfriend. So why do I need to walk into a room and say, hey, I'm Bane and I'm gay? Right. When you when you think about that and you walking into a room and that's the first thing you announce, people would be like, what are you talking about? Like, what that's are you the, on? That's the frustrating like, part. Sweet, about- dude. <laughs> Uh, that's a frustrating part about maybe the social media aspect of it, of, of the response of like, yeah, we don't care. Like this doesn't need to be told where it's like, no, but it does because you don't really understand what these guys are dealing with and what they're doing for the next wave of, of player and or person that needs to let this out and stop essentially living this lie. Right. And it's like, it, yeah, it's, we- it's for them to come out whenever they want, whenever they choose to, but it's like, it's, it's more than that. That's why they, that's, that's why you did it. That's why Scott MacArthur did it. That's, why luke's doing it they're not necessarily just doing it for themselves they're also doing it for the next person so they can feel comfortable yeah so now there's a kid maybe in in red deer alberta that goes oh my god i wanted to play in the western hockey league but i can't because i'm gay and now luke prokop's done that so if you never have seen something done in front of you you don't know that it's possible right so now hopefully it just makes the road easier you know and hopefully it's not i hope in 10 years this isn't a story but Right now in society, we're so far behind in hockey that we have to celebrate it because hockey isn't there yet, right? Hockey is not there yet. And I think it's up, 
but it takes guys like you guys to amplify it and not just, you know, it takes, you know, whether it's, you know, a funny story that Luke Prokop, you know who he got a call from two days ago, Elton John. I kid you not. Elton John reached out to his agent and he saw it on CNN and said, he got a phone call. Hey Luke, it's Sir Elton John. And I'm like, Oh man. Like that's how You're that's like, how I didn't global. get a call. I, and I love Ray's like Mick Jagger calls me once yeah. a week, dude. It's sick. I said to Luke, I said, pass on his email. I love it. <laughs> get some tickets out of it. Yeah. Seriously? Hey, one thing that Tyson Berry said is uh he said when you when you were there in Toronto with him, he said you'd be coming out to every group so you could open up a fancy bottle of wine to celebrate. And and Tyson's yeah, yeah. like, Hey man, if you just want to b- bust open a fancy bottle of wine, you can just do it. You don't have to you don't have to use that as the excuse. <laughs> yeah, Tice Tice was Tice's and his wife Emma have become great friends of mine. I remember they rented Cadre's place and we were over there and having drinks one night. And it, it, oddly enough, I think Tice knew, you know, and Biz, you, you know, people know. Yeah, we knew. But, yeah, but it's 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 up to but you it, when you wanted to until, do it. Right? Until someone owns it, you know, like until you're ready to present that yourself, you never want to out someone. I know people that are gay that I would never out because that's the most horrific thing ever to not control. Yes. And really by coming out, it means that no one can use my sexual uh, I, orientation against me, right? Now, no one, I've had people come up and threaten to out me when I was in the closet. It's the worst feeling ever, right? And people just want to take jabs and people want to, it's like cutting you down. So now by coming out, I've removed that. Hey, sure, call me gay. I already told the whole world I'm gay. So use something else against me. Call me a bad guy, call me a bad agent, but it's not, I'm not, you're not going to tear me down because you're calling me gay. And I think when you can control your own narrative, I think that's huge. Yeah, we didn't care. We just wanted to see the high kicks. <laughs> <laughs> I think your text, your text to me was, "I don't care who you who you're with," but uh, yeah. yeah, it's all good. I'm, uh, I, boy, we appreciate your time, man. Yeah, this is great. Thank you very I think much, man. It's, it's going to resonate yeah, with a no, lot I of people. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. I hope, I hope it's, uh, it's good. And you know, I appreciate you guys, you know, taking this, you know, and talking. Obviously, stories are fun, but with Luke and you know what it means for the hockey world, and you know the reaction that we've seen and. I just think, you know, I hope one day we aren't talking about it, but until that day, I really appreciate you guys amplifying it and, and, and using your platform and followers to, uh, you know, strike, uh, stick on these important issues. Absolutely. Let me know that you can lead on those tickets for Elton John. I'll be joining you. Oh, I'll be Elton. I'll be front I, row. I said, Luke, you got to be in Nashville. I'll just come down and make sure everything's all good with the media and we'll check out Elton. Yeah. I think he's doing one, one final reunion. Uh, what is it called? Uh, your final tour. He's done it like five different times, but he calls it. Oh, I saw, him in, I saw him in Toronto. La- I saw him in Toronto last year and he's definitely on the back nine, if not the 24th hole. So he, uh, he's, <laughs> I think he just knows now he could just probably play a mixtape. It's like going to a DJ show and he'll sell out 18,000. And he's like, why wouldn't I, you know? Yeah. He's got to pay for his flower budget. I heard he's got like a hundred thousand dollar flower budget every day. You know, his husband's Canadian, eh? From Kelowna. Oh, no way. David, yeah, his husband they met, and he's, I think, many years younger than him, but he's a Canadian guy. So they've got some Kelowna and BC ties there with old Elton. So maybe maybe we'll get a retirement place beside Webbs or Pricer or one of those guys. Let's get him at Stampede. Now we're talking. Oh, now we're talking. All right. Well, Boehner, thank you once again, my friend. And uh, this is awesome. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks Thanks so much, Boehner. Appreciate it. Okay. Ciao. Enjoy the weekend. See ya. Big thank you to Bane Pettinger, and uh, I was actually texting with him afterwards. With now, were you playing in the game where TJ Oshie had the shootout when it was USA versus Russia? No, that was in Sochi. I was in the Olympics prior in Vancouver, but I remember oh. watching that. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, well, he was saying that uh, during the game when Putin showed up, all the cells went down. Like as soon as he rolled into the building, no more cell service, and then ended up as soon as yeah, he watched the whole game. No one's cell phones were working, and all of a sudden he took off. Chopper leaves, and all of a sudden the cell phones were back on. So what a I'm, I'm sure a wild experience in Sochi for those guys with that guy around. I'd be sleeping with one eye open, especially for the shit that you say with, about him on the podcast. Biz, did you say sleep? Yes. Well, America has a problem. Everyone is exhausted and out of it because they're not sleeping in a bed that's right for them. And the sleep well, they they're getting kids. sucks. And this problem has a name. It's called junk sleep. Unfortunately, I know about this stuff all too well because sometimes I stay up too late or I work in bed before going to sleep. You watch TV in bed before going to sleep. You're using your phone, your tablet in bed when you're trying to go to sleep, not taking the time to unwind from the day and prepare for bed or a poor quality mattress. That's why you need to talk to a mattress firm sleep expert. 
The sleep experts at Mattress Firm will match you to the best mattresses and sleep products out there based on your specific sleep preferences so that you can get your best sleep possible. And we are excited to be partnering with them for this year's Hockey Fest, helping spread the word on how to unjunk your sleep. To unjunk your sleep, go to mattressfirm.com or a mattress firm store today and sleep. I'm sorry, and speak with a sleep expert. And boys, like we said, they're sponsoring our hockey fest. We're going to be in Detroit uh, about a week and a half, right, Grinelli, for the roller hockey tournament? We will, August 6th and 7th. And rumor, rumor has it some old bastard's going to be coming out of retirement for that and strapping on the pads again. But I don't know, it could get ugly. But either way, check them out by all means, mattressfirm.com or a mattress firm store near you and sleep with the sleep. Check with the sleep expert. I can I could use a new mattress right about now. All right, boys, the draft, we already tipped. Dipped our toes into a little bit, but I said this is the probably the biggest crapshoot ever for a draft, given the, the way the last year turned out. So many guys didn't play. They didn't get in full seasons. Now, Owen Power did go first, as expected. Uh, it was also what you were just talking about, teammates. It was the first time since 1969 that teammates went with the first two selections. It was a Canadian junior team back then. It wasn't a college team. And also Michigan. Michigan becomes the first college hockey team to have two current players selected at number one and number two in an entry draft. And also, we got to mention Grinelli's brothers, Luke Hughes. Unreal. What the? What was it? Fifth, uh, fourth overall to New Jersey. He joined his teammate Jack, who was absolutely bananas. Man, that was he was a great, great was video. Absolutely more more excited than than, the, than his brother who got picked. Uh, and the brothers became the first American trio to be selected in the first round, and the first trio of siblings to all be taken in the top ten. And the Hughes boys are just the third trio of brothers to all get taken in the first round, joining the Sutters. Uh, Ron, Rich, and Brent, and the Stahl brothers. So uh, very exciting time for the Hughes boys and for the Michigan program. Uh, were there any major surprises, Biz? I'll go to you first. I know you watched the Soup Tonight. Any major surprises in this draft for you? Well, I got to go back to uh, Quinn Hughes, who's got jokes. He said, uh, roll the clip, actually, for the interview after Grinnell. So, Quinn, take me into the conversation. So after the Ducks made their pick, what were you saying to each other here? I, I just think we weren't sure um, if, we were, if he was going there or not. Of course, everyone wanted him to go there and – um, I was kind of just telling him, like, if you don't go there, don't worry about it. Like, the rink stinks anyways. And... <laughs> so I don't know why he's trashing on New Jersey's building, but, uh, you know, he... It's a I quiet thought... barn, dude. Is that why he said it was trash? I just remember playing there. I, I don't think the building's trash. I think for being as new as, as it is, it's not great, right? Where you notice, like, it was kind of like the garden. They built the garden. You're like, what the fuck? It's like two years later, it was, like, out of style. I think jerseys could have been a little better. More than anything, though, and probably for their lack of success recently, it's a quiet barn. And going to uh, the old man, Jim, holy shit. You see what these horses are selling their sperm for? What do you think he could get for a batch of his fucking well, my sperm? my question, you... <laughs> He released, you dropped the picture of that super sperm t-shirt. Are we not selling those? Was that just no, a joke? No, that was How just are a we joke. not selling those? I, I was like, Grinelli, get me one. He's like, no, we're not selling those. That's fake. <laughs> How do we, though, that shirt was, who made that shirt? Uh, Google. Oh I just Googled God, super shout sperm. Out Google. So now you got Quinn who went seventh. You got Luke who goes fourth. And then uh, was the other one first overall? Yeah, Jack, Jack went first. Oh, my goodness. So they overtook the stalls as the super sperm donors to the NHL. Anyway, what do you what do you make of all the the draft business? Ra, it was a family affair. Yeah, it was it was a great story. Like I said, for Michigan in the Hughes, and also I want to uh, give a, a shout out to Minnesota. I don't know if it was the organization's call or Bill Karen's Bill Garren's call, but they brought on Tom Curvis's four children. Of course, he passed away from a long battle of cancer. He was assistant GM, and they let uh, the children make the announcements, which is just a, a nice, classy touch to see. It's I mean a bittersweet moment for the family, but if you were watching it at home, it, it was kind of a hot woman moment. And uh, the draft wasn't without controversy either, Biz. Uh, Logan, uh, did you say it, Melo, Melo, the the guy who he ran, he renounced his draft rights, but you really can't do that because Montreal basically renounced him renouncing his draft rights and they still took him 30. You can't triple stamp a double overall. stamp. Yeah, exactly. Now, in case you're not familiar, uh, he's a defenseman. He was fined in Sweden. Uh, he took a photo without consent of a sexual encounter he was having with a young woman. Um, she ended up calling the cops on him. He wasn't arrested. He was fined. Um, you know, he's obviously felt like shit about it. He said that I don't, I'm not worthy of being drafted this year. I need to still mature. Uh, Montreal felt different and they opted to use their first rounder on him. Again, he's a defenseman and the team had a statement ready to roll right after. So they knew they were going to get, get, uh, what do you call it? The shit was going to hit the fan with this pick. Um, I guess I'm not really surprised given what, you know, what we see with teams. I mean, teams overlook shit that guys do all the time. And it was a terrible thing he did. Uh, I guess it does raise the question of like, 
if he went through the courts there, like, does a guy have to be punished for the rest of his life? Can he, can he make a living? I'm, I'm not saying yeah. the right answer, wrong answer, but Montreal decided, Hey, we'll, we'll help this kid grow. I know that's a, a, a reason teams sometimes give, but it was a, it was a surprise because the kid said, don't draft me. And then Montreal goes and drafts him of all teams. So uh, not without controversy. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was shocked. Um, what was really surprising is it's like they had other pick, you know, they have second round picks later on, Unless they had were unless they really liked the player, which obviously they did because they took him in the midst of, of a shit storm and they really liked him. Now, maybe they heard rumors that somebody behind them was going to take him and that they couldn't wait till the second round or third round, whatever their next pick was. It's fucking bizarre because to hear the kid actually say, I don't want to be drafted. I don't deserve to be drafted and them to disagree with them. It, it is, it is an odd situation. It pissed off a lot of hockey fans, you know, to no surprise, right? You've seen how his, especially the way hockey Twitter works, people were disgusted and, and, and they were upset at the pick. Um, I was, I was, I was just more than anything shocked because to deal with that and go through that, it just almost seems like it's not worth it considering he's not like, you know, a top, he's not a top end talent, you know, to be a first rounder, it's a big deal. But if this kid was a surefire top five pick, it's one thing, but to hear what he said and to know what he did. And now quickly, just, it was consensual sex, whatever, what was going on. I I think that there's been rumors circulating, you know, it was the picture taken and the sharing of the picture on Snapchat to his teammates. That was the issue. And from what I've read, the girl really wanted a true full apology that yeah. he apparently hadn't given. Yeah, that was and the issue. Is that's he that's wanted a, that's a heartwarming an apology right originally, where I think she was even willing to accept the, like the fact that he'd made a mistake, but the, she didn't feel like he was actually remorseful or and or didn't even get one initially, and it, it you know and, and it took it going public to finally get one that she felt she deserved. Now that's whether she is ever going to come around given that she didn't get one initially. I don't know, but it guys, I mean, it's, it's, you know, if, if I'm a father and that's my daughter, I, I obviously feel very strongly about it. And uh, I, yeah, this is a, a shitty situation. So I hope that, uh, you know, they can figure it out behind the scenes and, and, you know, they can, she especially can end up getting to peace about it. And other than that, man, yeah, that was a, uh, that was a bit of a curveball for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's tough to, you know, it's shitty to talk about, but it's news and we do got to talk about it. And to go back to it, he, I guess he, he took a picture during the act and then he actually included like her profile from whatever social media account. So like if he didn't send that, they probably wouldn't even know who it was, but he included that. So it was like, you know, no question who, who it was. Yeah, and and when you it. say that, when you say that, um, you, you know, you weren't surprised in a sense that teams will in every sport will sign guys that are not necessarily good people because they're very good at what they do. Um, that is true. Now what's different in this situation is it's not a guy who's had a ton of success in the, in the NHL or the NFL or the NBA. And then he's a free agent and it's like teams like, I don't care. It's, it's to know what he did. And then still any draft pick is a risk and to go ahead and do it is what was surprising. You know, it, it wasn't as, it wasn't as normal to me if I saw a team sign, uh, Pac-Man Jones, right. Or something that some guy who'd been in trouble with the law. It was, it, it was like, this guy hasn't even done anything yet. And you're still willing to face the fucking heat. So, you know, Montreal sticking to their guns, Mark Bergevin sticking to his guns. But like I said, and most of you guys say it was, it was shocking that he did go in the first round at, at all in the draft, even. Yeah. I, I got to tell you that the name of the first round, the best name, Chaz Lucius. That sounds like a 1950s boxer or something, just an all time name. He went to Winnipeg 18 overall. Um, yeah, it was, I mean, I'd say it was kind of a run of the mill draft. I mean, not to be not no disrespect to the players, but once the draft started, there were no major moves. I think everybody was kind of sitting there waiting for a big trade to happen, but it all seemed to have gone down well before that. Um, all right, let me hop in here real quick. Actually, the third overall pick, uh, we talked about it with Shane Doan on the, the Pink Whitney draft show, the pre-draft show anyway. Uh, and he talked about the fact that he ended up uh, going overseas this year because there was no OHL going on. So uh, I'll throw it over to that real quick. And uh, if you want more breakdowns of the top 15 picks, uh, you can head over to YouTube and watch it. Uh, Mason McTavish, um, another guy who ended up bumping up because he ended up going over to Swiss and playing. And uh, he, he wasn't even in the top 10. Uh, coming into this year but he went over there great 200 foot center and he's another guy who's got some uh some bite to his game he was playing with the peterborough Peets, right yeah he was and he have you seen pictures of the guy 
Yeah, he looks like he looks thick. He's a man. Like yeah. he's a man. Like he's he, do, he's Shane Doan getting drafted. Well, yeah, but he's Big got your cock. hair. He's got your. <laughs> He's got your hair and beard right now. Like it's <laughs> sick. He's got a full beard. He looks like a man and he, got he, four kids. <laughs> yeah. He Just went over smoking to smoking outside the building before the games. <laughs> yeah. Post game over- beers. <laughs> Co- kicks the coach out of his seat when he gets on the bus. <laughs> hey, bumper Throw, back. Throws both hands. Just yeah, you the, know, the, the whole the whole Just a throwback. Yeah. Um, he went over to Switzerland and had a it actually really, really helped him because I think a lot of people were questioning his skating and that was probably, and not rightfully so. They just weren't sure about it. And when he got over to Switzerland and played on the bigger ice, he was really impressive and he really bumped up because of the opportunity that he got in Switzerland. And then he went to the U18s and was he was, a, he was a man. Like he was, when you watched him play against people his age, it was pretty impressive. And uh, he's really, he's jumped up a lot and a lot of people really like him. Hockey Canada really liked him. I know Scotty Salmon and those guys were big fans of his, so uh, they raved about him. So Mason McTavish, uh, third overall draft pick, an absolute man, drinking beer, stealing the stealing the coach's seat on the bus, just a, an absolute brick shit house wit. Yeah, and in Anaheim, a um, couple couple years of struggle, uh, but now you look at Zegras, uh, Drysdale sick on D. Um, now you add this kid, who who a lot of people have or I've seen it like Ryan O'Reilly mentions, right? And Bob Murray's somebody, he likes physicality, he likes big, you know, power forwards. And that kid sounds like he's going to be a legit NHL player. A um, couple other NHL draft moments that I wrote down was uh, just the celebration from Brant Clark. Uh, he was he was playing with Barry and LA picked him eighth overall. Not often do you see a player get, get as emotional as 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 their their parents do usually, right? And this kid right away, he's just, you know, he's kind of wiping the tears away from his eyes, hugging his parents and his family. It was such a cool moment to see his genuine happiness coming true for him, you know, and, and, and coming out and being like eighth overall pick to an awesome city, a great team in LA, a great team you'd want to be drafted by, I should say. That was a cool video. Um, Detroit went and picked... Uh, big D man, Simon Edvinson. I don't know if it's Simone, Simon, he's from Sweden. So what they did is they went out and got a monster defenseman to also match Morris, Moritz Sider, I believe his name is, who was, uh, maybe the fourth pick or another high German top, kid. Yeah. German stud. He was sick this year in the Swedish elite league. Um, so you got two bookends on D right. Two young guys. Eiserman knows what he's doing. I really like that selection build from the goal out um other than that ra you're right it was a little bit of a well i'm gonna a, hop in here you got you, you you forgot to mention that other detroit pick i talked about him earlier the 6-6 goaltender sebastian kosa that was a big move in order to move up to number 15 he was supposed to be the second goal he picked and eiserman had obviously seen enough to think that he is genuinely vasilevsky 2.0 just yeah. that big presence in net um you mentioned uh william eckland but uh the family affair situation mike sillinger's kid actually ended up getting drafted. Cole Sillinger, uh, who was joking around about it on Twitter. It was, uh, uh, who's the guy? Sillinger from- played for the Blue Jackets at one point, right? Played for everyone. They had to be one of the teams. Yeah, yeah so that's did. what Yeah, so that's what Kelly Chase was joking around about. He said he was going over to his draft party, and he said, although it sucks it's not live, he says he's one guy that has an 80% chance that he'll be able to pull on a jersey because his old man's got them all in the back from every team. So uh, the, more, the more family uh, ties were uh, Colton Doc. Kirby Doc, Kirby Doc's brother, of course, Seth Jones' brother ended up coming over in that Duncan Keith trade, and then Seth Jones signed in Chicago. So that was kind of a, a happen all around the draft as well. Um, and then Kale McCarr's brother, uh, Taylor, ended up going to the 220th spot. So that was a good day for the family. That was the day he got his uh, six-year, nine million dollar deal as well. So uh, Brian Boucher's kid, tenth overall, and then uh, Brian Savage, his son named Red Savage. How dope is that? 114th that's overall name. to Detroit. So there was just plenty of uh, of people. And, of course, earlier I mentioned uh, Shane Doan's kid drafted at 37th, second overall to the Coyotes, who uh, came out of the USHL of Chicago. Chicago Steel, shout out to that program. That's where Owen Power played the year before he went to Michigan, have become the dominant force in the United States Hockey League. I think the owner's got a ton of money. He's done a great job in building a premier franchise in the USHL. Um, And then the one kind of biggest off-the-board selection was Ottawa took Tyler Boucher uh, from the National Development Program. They took him 10th overall. Nobody 
I, I didn't see anything pre-draft in terms of having him that high. Um, but that was a selection where a lot of people said it's a DJ Smith type player in your face, pain in the ass prick with some offensive upside. So a little bit of a reach there at 10, but uh, obviously Ottawa sees something there that they think can end up being a future stud in the national league. Well said, Wit. Well said. Uh, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, a lot of the action was before the draft and the big name to go, Seth Jones. Uh, Chicago picked up Seth Jones, a first this year, the number 32 overall, a sixth and 22 uh, from Columbus for defenseman Adam Boquist, uh, a first this year, which was number 12 overall, a second and 21 in a conditional first and 22. Uh, if Chicago wins one of the 22 draft lotteries, the pick becomes the first and 23. And then Chicago went and signed Jones to an eight year, $76 million extension that uh, kicks in next season, 9.5 million average annual value. We suspected he was going to get traded. We suspected he was going to get paid. He got both wit as a fellow D-man. Let's go to you first. Wow. Wow is what I'll say. I want to shout out Yarmo Kekalainen. I, I think he did a phenomenal job here. I think I like Boquist. And the amount of draft picks that they got for this guy is, is wild, considering he pretty much had the team by the balls. He kept, sell, he kept telling them, oh, yeah, I'm, well, I'm not signing with you guys. And if you trade me to that team, I'm not signing with them. And then the team's not willing to give up what Columbus wants back. So in the end, it was his brother was in Chicago from the Keith trade, Biz, Biz had mentioned. He was open about, or I, I'm assuming he was very open with Columbus about wanting to be there. And the return they got was huge. Now, in terms of Seth Jones, I don't think since analytics have become a thing, there has been a player loved from the eye test and by the fan who isn't into analytics and hated by the analytics team and department of people who who do that for a living because it is a complete disconnect in terms of there's a group of people telling you and watching a player and saying this guy's dominant, he's a great defenseman, he does it offensively, he does it defensively, he's huge, he can eat minutes, he's physical, and the other side saying he stinks which is realistically kind of what they say. Not necessarily stinks, but in terms of what he's making and his consideration for being a top five, top 10 defenseman in the league, no, he's trash. That's what they say. You read the numbers. You read the wins above replacement is a big one. All these different factors to which it's an argument where you watch him play and he looks great, and people who watch him yet look at stats say he's no good. So the one thing I'll say is it's a fucking cap hit and a half. I mean, that is a lot of money for a guy who's still, what is he, 26 years old? So you're getting him in the prime of his career, but you are crunched at that number if you're Chicago. Nine and a half is no joke. Uh, Is he the highest paid defenseman in the league or no? No, No, Carlson's 11. Carlson, oh my God. Doughty Doughty might be a little bit higher. There's five defensemen right around that range, and Grinelli could pull him up while you finish your thought. Yeah, my thought is just like, I, I, I don't, I know this year, he was not the player. He was not a nine and a half million dollar defenseman. You just wonder how much of it has to go in with how much Columbus struggled and the loss of all the elite players there and the difference in terms of trying to play against top lines and playing big minutes with a team who struggles. Does that affect your analytics? What they say is no, because they look at each player individually and all the stats don't really take into effect a team struggling. Um, I like the player. I like the move. I think he's a number one D-man. I just think that's so much money. And they already have Kane at $10 million. They already have Taves at $10 million. The team struggled uh, kind of immensely over the past few years, right? They've looked nothing like the championship caliber teams they had years prior. And so I do like the move for Chicago to get him. They needed to get a force on the defensive side. But there was just so much money and such a long-term deal. It's going to see... It's going to be interesting to see three years from now where he's at as a player, because if he doesn't improve from last year, right away, you're looking at like, this is kind of a disaster of a contract. So the highest paid defenseman in the NHL next season, Eric Carlson, 11.5 mil, oh. Drew Doughty, 11 mil, Seth Jones, 9.5, Roman Yossi, 9, 9 mil, Subban, 9 mil, Petrangelo, oh. 8.8. I'd say uh, um, the two that are I'm okay with are, are Petro and uh, Yossi. I, I, I like Seth Jones a lot and, and from watching him. I, I, I agree completely with your breakdown of the fact that the anal- analytics community would probably trash this deal to the end of time. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see what he can do surrounded by better players and maybe a, a market where 
he's maybe a little bit more excited to play in. And that's not a knock at Columbus. It's just like you're under the bright lights a little bit more in Chicago. And sometimes that puts a little bit more pep in some guy's step. Is that, is that a fair comment? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, he didn't want to be in Columbus for a reason. He's going to one of the best cities in the world um, to a pretty sick atmosphere to play games in. The one thing that got me was it was, it was the extra first round pick next year. Um, it was because it was two first rounders, right? All right. So I know you just read it. It was a first and second next year. And then another first, right? It, uh, a first this year, a, a second this year. Yeah. And a conditional first in 22. So two first. And what's it's, the condition? It's a, a first this year, a second this year and a conditional first in 22. But if Chicago wins one of the 22 draft lotteries, the pick becomes the first in 23. So it's lottery protected next year. But in lottery protected, does that mean top three? Or I, I saw one thing that was the top two picks. It, w- it, w- it wouldn't count only if it was first or second. But Honestly, dude, third, I'm, I'm not yeah. I'm not 100% sure since they redid it. it I, I read it right off cap friendly. It said if Chicago wins one of the 22 draft lotteries. So um, okay. I'm not exactly sure how, how many. That now- extra first rounder, man. It's like, what? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. that was just, that was the, that was the kicker, you know. You saw, but you saw what Ristolainen, you saw what Ristolainen and that deal over to Philly got. It's like defense. They just put such a premium on having good defensemen. Not at all comparing Ristolainen to Seth Jones. Ristolainen's also despised by the analytic community and the eye test. He passes for a lot of guys. So defensemen, they get huge, enormous return. Look at Chris Kunitz for me. And you just <laughs> wonder if Chicago really struggles and even if the picks eighth overall, it's like they lose that. Then the next year is it was a big deal and a shocking deal. And I think in the end, Columbus is very happy with what they got back. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then you see Rick Nash behind Davidson at the draft looking great. He's looking good. Nash. <laughs> uh, and on the other side, Adam Boquist, he's in, uh, let's see the last year of his entry level deal. So he'll be our, a restricted free agent after this season. Uh, I know Chief wasn't too sad to see him go, but he's still a young kid. I think he's only, what, he's going to be 21 next month. So, you know, he's still a young defenseman. I think he, he can still reach his potential, certainly. I mean, a, a nice segue would, here would be talk about Philadelphia. I mean, they didn't stop there either. They, they ended up swapping Cam Atkinson and Voracek. And, yeah. and got rid of Voracek, uh, at least most of his, his salary. And, you know, you talk about the premium for defensemen. They ended up getting uh, Ryan Ellis a little bit cheaper than they, they did risk the line. But now to back that up, it's like it's hard to also look at a defenseman's numbers when he's been playing with the Buffalo Sabres. So I think you can you can maybe keep a, I mean, a fresh mindset while going in to assess that one. But it definitely tells me that I think that Philadelphia is looking at, at we got a, a pretty small window here to try to get this thing done in the next two to three years. And there's also rumblings that they might even sign Yance, you know, adding that extra layer of maybe security to, to help bolster their power play. You know, just, I I see him starting the year as a, as a six, you know, being a guy who's playing limited minutes, but also helping the power play. Is that a fair comment with? Yeah. I have no idea where he's signing and Philly'd be a great spot. I don't know what's going to happen with him. We, I haven't heard, heard back from him. I think he's got like four texts unreturned from me. Oh, he's Uh, dodging you. But Ch- uh, Chuck Fletcher said um, there was just a malaise around the Flyers, right? It was like we could not go into camp with the exact same team. So it's more than anything is is like culture change. You just got to change what's going on in this room. And it was an old old school one for one uh, Atkinson for Voracek trade. I think Atkinson's a year older than him, but less time on the deal. Um, I Maybe got yeah. those deals if you can, R.A., but... No, I got them all right here. Yeah, okay. Philly had a very busy week. They got Ellis last week, like we mentioned. Uh, they traded Shane Gostas Bear to Arizona along with the second and 22 and a seventh and 22. I'm not, I'm not nothing. Consider- Future considerations, which is basically another nothing, nothing trade for the Coyotes. Another, Love another it. Nothing. They just take money. Pronger, Datsu, Gostas Bear. Uh, they also traded Robert ha- Hag, Robert Hag. I'm not sure how you say his name. He had one year left at 1.6 mil, along with the first this year, which is 14 overall, and the second in 23 to Buffalo for the Ristolainen and deal we just mentioned. Ristolainen only has one year left at 5.4 mil, so that's a pretty risky trade right there. I mean, if that's he doesn't a very sign high him, price, that's pay. a high price to pay for a guy for one year. And uh, Voracek trade. This was a, a head scratcher for me from the Columbus side. Uh, Voracek to Philly. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Voracek back to Columbus rather. Cam Atkinson to Philly. Jake's got three years left at 8.25 mil. He's going to be 32 in a couple weeks at uh, 43 points in 53 games last year. Cam Atkinson is already 32. He's got four years left at 5.875 mil at 34 points in 56 games last year. Just a curious move from Columbus, man. I mean, 
Atkinson's been a pretty solid citizen for them. I basically part of their core and they bring him in. I would get rid of him rather. They bring in Jake. They're paying almost 3 million more a year for him. I just didn't understand this deal much from the Columbus side. I think they probably just want to start off with a clean slate. And, and I think Philly's getting a very solid player and a guy who, you know, I mean, he's making 5 million. I think he's a 30 goal scorer one time made the all-star team. If they can get him back to playing at that level with the, you know, his type of, of grittiness that he plays with. I don't know. I, I I I agree with you. The commitment's a long time at that number. But if you're if you're Columbus, you're probably like, hey, at least we can hit the reset button a lot sooner. And and, and they had room know. cap wise. Yes, and that's and that's the kicker. So, anyway, uh, is that it for Philadelphia? Uh, that's it for Philly. But we were just talking about the highest paid defenseman, and that list hadn't been updated because Kale McCarr. He signed his big money ticket. Well, his first big money ticket. He's going to be looking at another one in a few oh, years. Yeah. Oh, he's 27 years. when this one ends. Six-year deal, $54 million. The deal expires in 27. Uh, Colorado buys one year as free agency. And, um, I mean, nobody was surprised that this this number came in at what it did. I was probably a little surprised it came in under Jones. But uh, $9 million a year for Kale McCaw, money well spent. Kind of a no-brainer for them to do this. This is where you will not hear complaints. I don't think from anyone just because of his age, what he's shown so far. If you were to ask me one defenseman that is deserving of $9 million a year, I'd probably say Kale McCarr right now. Uh, Adam Fox is laughing. I mean, he comes off the Norris and his deal will be coming up at some point. What does this mean for him after seeing Heskin and McCarr's deal? I don't think people consider him at that echelon. I think it's McCarr, Heskinen, and then Adam Fox. But holy shit, if you have a Norris and who knows what he does next year, Adam Fox is looking at an enormous payday. I think it's a great move by the Avalanche. They still have some questions in terms of Grubauer. Rumor is he wants six times six. They do not want to go that high. They still have the Landeskog issue. But their number one number one thought was to get McCarr locked up and, and figure that out. And that was, that was a no-brainer the way they did it. No doubt about that. Uh, a couple other deals here. Oh, Biz, your, your team getting it done once again. Uh, Vancouver got Oliver Ekman Larson and Connor Garland for uh, the Well, they're still playing. Antoine Roussel, Jay Beagle, and Louis Erickson, uh, as well as a first round of this year, which was number nine overall, a second in 22, and a seventh in 23. OEL has six years left at $8.25 million. Uh, Garland is a restricted free agent in line for a pretty sizable raise. Uh, all three contracts going back to Arizona. Uh, equal $12 million. They all expire this year. So Arizona picking up some money for some future assets. But Vancouver, uh, Oliver Ekman Larson, probably a guy who needed to change his scenery. Yeah. Biz, had a rough, real rough year last year. He obviously waived his no trade clause to get there. And Connor Gallon, man, he was the heart and soul of that team, I thought, last year. And they didn't want to pay him or they just let him go. So well, give us your take here, Biz. Well, I think that – well, I think he was asking for at least $5 million, which he deserved because he earned it. And given with the precedent that they've set on other players that they've paid, yeah, Gar- Garland was far and above, I think, our best player, especially when he was in the lineup. He was injured for, for a few games last year. But I think for Vancouver to also take on Oliver and his salary, they did retain a tiny bit of it. Um, they had to give up another valuable asset, which was Connor Garland. And, um, you know, they, they move on from Oliver and it sucks to see him go. I love them as a player. I still think he's got a lot of game left. He definitely needed, needed to hit a reset button. I, I hope he's uh, welcomed with open arms there. And, and, uh, and he has a, a season or seasons much like he's had in the past. Now, as far as Arizona, we know it's a full on blow up. They're trying to, <laughs> why are you, why are you giggling like that? Oh, it's like, it couldn't be more obvious. The sun, the sun sets at like, you know, seven thirty right now, and 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 then tomorrow morning around like six a.m. the sun will come up, and and then Arizona next year will will blow it up. <laughs> You're a fucking asshole. But You're hey, fucking the, disgraceful. Right now it's bad. It's it's a, and I said on the last podcast, it's got to get worse before it gets better, and I would assume this season will not be a very pleasant one. Now, mind you, at least we get to start by drafting ninth overall this year, which we got Dylan Gunther, which was a guy that Bob McKenzie had pegged in about the three to six range. And one of the most uh, dynamic offensive players in the draft, he has a great shot. So let's hope that this kid can end up popping off. And this is the actual beginning of the rebuild because until they got that ninth overall, they weren't picking till I believe 37th. And, you know, you, you never really know what you're getting in the second round. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's been ugly for the last couple of years. Uh, we've put ourselves in a bit of a bind 
And, uh, and hopefully, uh, like I said, the, the rebuild starts now. And this deal for me, a couple different things coming from Vancouver. Jim Benning is, I'm guessing, looking at this, like if I don't make the playoffs, if they don't make the playoffs, I'm done. So I have to try to make this team better. He did make the team better, no doubt, with Garland and Ekman Larson. They are a better team than they were last year. The thing with Ekman Larson is he gets the puck on his stick, beautiful. There's no issues. What he struggles with is defending. Now, the crazy thing is Vancouver spends a ton of time in their own zone. So if... Ekman Larson been traded to, uh, let's say, like the Islanders or the Bruins, teams with very, very solid defensive systems where you can almost hide players' deficiencies defensively because of how the team plays. Vancouver's not one of those teams. So it's what he struggles at is an issue for the entire team in Vancouver. So that'll be interesting to see. But he can move the puck. He can skate. It's a big deal. But he's going to need to play better because he's out of the spotlight in van in uh, phoenix where nobody watches he's now going into a canadian market he's a high played player the pressure will be on the fans will be all over him if he does struggle defensively as he has the past few years so biz i know you say you think he's got a, a level to get back to and he will that question remains but vancouver is better and gillis looks at it like we have to be better or i'm gone anyway so i Benning. won't even be i won't even be here to deal with this contract in four seasons if if it doesn't go well anyway so at this point let's try to get Get better i love garland that's a great move for them that help out, helps out offensively and i do think vancouver is going to be much improved and looking to get into the playoffs so they got some work to do deal. still they got to sign some guys here that's what that's one of the reasons of course yep. jake for got bought out they got uh i think they got about 20 million in cap space and they need to sign garland they need to sign elias petterson they need to get quinn hughes a new contract so uh, you know or, you know, Benning, Benning's biggest flaw, I think, well, one of the major ones has been his, his ability to manage the cap. And he's always pretty much jammed up on it. So we'll see how they're able to, to maneuver through this situation. But I agree with you, Whit. They're, they're much improved and a team that, on paper, they should make playoffs this year. Yeah, in that Pacific division, they, they, they are a team that looks to me like a playoff team. I wonder what Pedersen's deal comes in at. You know, you got to think eight and a half, nine, right? I could see him being the type of guy to get a bridge deal. Yeah. And, and I don't know if he's going to be willing to sign that. I know that him and uh, Quinn Hughes ended up uh, getting the same agent. I don't know if Elias Pettersson left his agency in order to go to Quinn Hughes's agent or vice versa, but I'm, I'd imagine they're working as a team at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so Benning's going to get the fucking sandpaper finish special from, from the agency. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. He's okay. Fuck- now we have Pettersson done. Let's go to Quinn. The guy's like, Oh fuck. Oh, we're out of cap space. Oh Jesus. Uh, boys. All right. We got a few more transactions before we send oh, yeah. it to Terry Ryan. No, there's a lot, a lot going on. Uh, Taylor Hall, he did end up re-upping him here in Boston. Four-year, $24 million deal. He's got a no-move clause and a modified no-trade clause for the last three years. Uh, this seemed like a deal with that was ine- inevitable. He wanted to be here. The team wanted him here. Uh, I'm not sure if he's going to have a cent to David Krejci or not, but either way, a pretty reasonable deal for, for Taylor Hall. Yeah, very reasonable. I, I, I did not see any... Uh, unhappy Bruins fans. I'm sure there were some out there, but Halsey played phenomenal <laughs> when he came over. I know that second round series against the Islanders, he didn't play great, but nobody did for Boston. It was a struggle against that team. And I love the signing. I'm happy for him. I think he he's always wanted to be on the Bruins, right? When it came down to Taylor versus Tyler, he's kind of hoping that the Bruins had the first over, overall selection. He goes to Edmonton, and in the end, he, go, he gets to go to a city and a team that he always wanted to be at, and then when he came over, really enjoyed. So I was happy for him, and I think a very team-friendly deal, a player-friendly deal, and good for him. Happy. Former Absolutely. roommate. Shout out Halsey. And, uh, Fluto Shinzawa of The Athletic, uh, he reported today that uh, no dice on Ryan Suda coming to the Bruins. I know every time there's a free agent, every Bruins fan thinks someone's going to come here. But Yeah, Elliot uh, said looks like Dallas. Yeah, doesn't look like he'll be here. Uh, the Rangers signed Barkley Goodrow, six-year, 21.85 deal, a uh, million-dollar deal. Comes out to three three point six four AAV, uh, modified no-trade clause. Of course, they traded for his rights before he went uh, – to free agency, pretty good deal for the kid. Uh, Edmonton signed 39-year-old goaltender. I know you already mentioned this, Biz. I didn't give the numbers yet. Mike Smith, two years, $4.4 million. Uh, Detroit signed Mark, defenseman Mark Stahl, one year, $2 million deal. He's got a no-move clause as well. Uh, let's see. Florida traded goalie prospect Devin Le- uh, Levi in a conditional first in 22 for forward Sam Reinhardt. Uh, Reinhardt's a restricted free agent. He made $5.2 million last year. Uh, the condition on the pick. 
uh, condition is if the pick is in the top 10, the pick will be exchanged with Florida's 2023 20, first round pick. Florida I like also- uh, I like that deal. I like Reinhardt. I was shocked to see Ristolainen got more in return than Reinhardt did. Um, that was surprising, but that's a nice deal. Along with their signing of uh, Sam Bennett, which was four years times four. Um, after what he did, I think it was times four, maybe 4.2, but he came over and lit it up with Florida. He got away from Calgary where he never thought he got his chance to play top two lines. He was over point per game with his games in Florida and then a point per game in that first round loss uh, versus Tampa. So Florida, with what Tampa's lost and how Florida looked last year and what they've done this summer, that battle for the state of Florida might be a lot closer than, than people think. So um, Reinhardt's a nice player. And in the end, Ristolainen's gone and, and, and Reinhardt's gone and Eichel's still there. And Kevin Adams comes out and he mentions on Saturday, shockingly, that he will not be, uh, I don't think he said surprise, but uh, not be upset at all or, or could see in the future Jack Eichel still being on the Sabres when the season starts. Now Eichel's agents, Peter Fish and uh, Pete Donatelli were were, were had quotes given where they said uh, we're under the understanding he will be traded, um, you know, making it pretty clear. He does not want to be there. Eichel still hasn't had surgery. He's skating, but they haven't been able to come to agreement because the Sabres don't want him to get the surgery he wants to get. So a lot of question marks still there with Eichel. And I can't imagine what's going to go down if they end up not trading him. Cause then you look at a player. Is he willing to sit out? Is he willing to openly, um, make make his frustrations public i think he kind of already has but shocking to see him not dealt yet but in the end you got to give kevin adams a little bit of credit in saying i'm not trading this guy until i get what he wants until i get what i want and the ask is astronomical according to every insider in the league and you know buffalo doesn't have to trade him they're not obligated yeah. to just because the player wants to and i mean he really doesn't have leverage right now it's not this anything he can leverage against buffalo if he opts not to play then he doesn't get paid so you know, you can say you want to get traded, but if a team doesn't get the value they deserve back, then, then they'll make you sit there and whatever. I mean, he's not going to sit out. He's not going to kiss away $10 million. Well, I mean, I mean, I guess an option would be he could go on long-term IR because he's still got the neck issue. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, just so get paid. yeah that, could, a, that could get ugly. But more exactly, doctors because, Ari, you too. say in the end, like, no leverage. Yeah, I guess, like, if you look at it black and white, he doesn't, but – you don't want a locker room where you got your captain and best player, like not wanting to be there. That's just a disaster for any team that's trying to get out of the doldrums. Right. I just mean, it's not a situation he can let like leverage something to his advantage. He basically, I don't want to be here and I'll find me a trade. I mean, that that's what's obviously is going to happen. Uh, Let's see the Rangers traded forward path. Pavel Buchnevich, this is a little bit of a surprise. Buchnevich. Uh, he's a restricted free agent. He made three and a quarter mil last year. They sent him to St. Louis for forward Sammy Blay, who's got one year left at a million and a half. He's going to be RFA after that contract. And the second in 22, uh, Buchnevich is a hell of a player for the Rangers. He kind of looked like he finally come into his own. And But they got to kind of pick who they want to keep. They're, they're going to have a little cap crunch as well. You mentioned Fox is going to be coming up soon enough. Uh, they need to save some money, put some money aside. So I was a little surprised on this one, Biz. Were you? Um. I, I like the I like Sammy Blay as a player. I think he's going to provide something good to that to that New York lineup. Um, I think that they also, as you said, it, it all it's all coming down to the money and the, and the long term commitment. So I um, I actually thought that this trade kind of made the most sense out of any trade I saw because St. Louis struggles scoring. They need some skill up front. He gives them that. His his most legendary moment on the Rangers is when he sh- when he fucking shot the shot the gun at the goalie after he scored and then Tampa tried jumping him and Avery was laughing at him. I remember the clip because it was during a, <laughs> it was during a lead up to the winter classic, the 24 seven. That was funny. That was that long ago. I know he's been Holy there quite a while. Shit. And then Sammy blade, what does the Rangers need? They need to be tough to play against. It cannot be a cakewalk with a Wilson incident, everything everyone talked about. They need to have players who make it difficult to go into MSG and play the Rangers. And he's one of those guys. So it was a trade that made total sense with the skill the Rangers have up front and the money they need to spare to sign future, you know, guys coming up with their deals ending. The deal made a lot of sense to me. Okay. Moving right along. Carolina made a few trades as well. They traded defenseman Jake Bean, a restricted free agent to Columbus for a second rounder in 21. Columbus finally replaced Grant Klitsum on the back end with Bean. Uh, Carolina also traded goalie Alex Nedeljkovic to Detroit for goalie uh, Jonathan Bernier in a third in uh, 21. And then Detroit went and signed Nedeljkovic to a two-year, $6 million extension. Seemed like short money to get a guy who was a call the finalist last year. But like you said, Biz, uh, Stevie Wife, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Fleeced? Uh, fleeced? Fleeced, and that's the word. Okay, I mean, so 
I, I don't know if that's the correct word because listen, I think he's an incredible goalie. I think that uh, he, he didn't have the largest sample size. It's evident that this was going to go to arbitration and they were concerned about the number that he was going to be awarded. So they figured it's best to just part ways. And from what from like what I was reading, at least on on social media, but from some pretty reputable people, is they felt that they needed a little bit of experience in net because it looks like Carolina's in the in the time period of where they want to try to compete for a cup. Now, I believe they also have three goalies that are UFAs, so they still got to bring back Reimer. Which, well, I mean, yeah, he's got experience, but I don't think he's the guy who's going to get you over the hump. Do I think that um, – who's the other one I'm drawing a blank Marazic. on? Right? Marazic. I mean, sure. I think that he's a guy they need to bring back. And who is the other UFA? Well, yeah, Bernier, Reimer, and Marazic, the three goalies Correct. that Carolina so Ber- has, all UFA right now. And, so. and, and, and right, they, and they got to re-sign Bernier. So, I don't know. They, they got some work to do, too. I know Martinuk's a UFA. Uh, there's in the, I think Fogel's name's popped up quite a bit. So there's there's a lot of work to do. But as far as that, uh, uh, Nadelkovich, I like the risk by Detroit because if it doesn't work out, whoop de fucking do big, big deal. But for Carolina, I mean, I don't know. It was know, a man. head scratcher. Yeah. If you, I mean, if you're going to give Reimer two, I would have gave, I would have gave Nadelkovich three. Now, they said that he might have came in around the three and a half number if he went to arbitration. But I think, I think that they thought it could even be higher. Higher? I think oh. there was like they, they worried about four, oh my maybe a little bit more. Now Which here's is, the thing, Biz. He's only they, he only played twenty eight games, I believe. I know, but like you, you look at what he did, and for me it was looking that Carolina has looked for years for a goalie. For years. And they had this homegrown talent who played great in the AHL and he comes up to the NHL and he looks awesome. And it's like, all right, we kind of got our guy, at least from what we've seen in a small sample size, he looks great. And the issue is Carolina is a, like a full blown analytics team. They, they really are huge into looking at the, the, the advanced, the macro stats, whatever the words are. And they probably look at it like there's so many UFA goalies out there. Now you keep hearing uh, from insiders, uh, Ranta's name as a guy that they'll look to sign. Now he seems to be injured quite a bit. So that's like quite a, question. a bit. That's the fucking understatement of the year. I think he's <laughs> on the fucking IR every other week. It's crazy, man. No, I, I know, but great, when he plays, great. he looks good. But to look at it just like totally statistics wise and not necessarily believe Nadalkovic is your man, it wasn't like he was going to get six million. It was, I just was, I just, I didn't, it didn't make sense to me. It didn't make sense to most people I read, you know, comments from. And, and in the end, Detroit looks good and getting a goalie that they can rely on with a team that they're trying to turn into winners. When you talk about culture and you talk about tanking for the draft, Detroit's not into that. You've seen what they're doing and they're trying to really build something there. And I know they're doing it through the draft, but they're also realizing if we can get a young goalie at not a crazy price who we've seen and really think is like a future number one, then let's go out and grab them. So Carolina really risks their uh, goaltending situation in going into the UFA market and being confident they'll get a guy that they think can do just as well as Nadalkovic. But that's a big question to be remains to be seen. So my only pushback is uh, I was it was uh, 38 games he's played in the NHL. So that's a pretty tough, like you know, that's not a lot of sample size in order to just hand over. You said it might be in the four million range. Well, I don't necessarily disagree with them on that, but I also think that they're in a situation where they don't. It's not like they have all these other amazing goalies lined up that they need to sign. He was he would be the guy I would probably give the net to start the season. Him or Mrazek. I mean, if Bernier, whether he signs or not, I mean, he's UFA. I'd be surprised if he ends up in Carolina, but basically it was a third rounder, man. That's kind of a no brainer. to get a, a, a call the trophy winner for a third rounder. That's, that's well, a no brainer by Stevie Y. I'm, I'm sorry. Call the finals. I'm sorry. I apologize. I know we didn't. Uh, one other trade we did. You did mention already um, is Calgary traded a fourth and 22 to Seattle to bring uh, Tyler Pitt, Tyler Pitlick in. He's got one year left at 1.75 mil, just a little house clean. Good player. Yeah, nice little player. So, all right, boys, I think we should send it over to uh, to Terry Ryan. He's been waiting patiently. But first, we want to let you know that this interview is presented by OCB Rolling Papers, the largest rolling paper brand in the world and has been one with nature, crafted naturally since 1918. So you know they've perfected the process for a consistently great session time after time. Now make bamboo your second favorite plant when you try OCB Bamboo Rolling Papers. 
America's first ultra-thin, slow-burning bamboo rolling papers and cones that have been taking the market by storm. Ask for OCB rolling papers wherever you buy your papers and sample the entire line of products. In the meantime, OCB has an unreal deal for our listeners. Visit ocbusa.com slash chicklets to get four booklets of OCB rolling papers and a rolling tray for just $4.99. It's probably the best deal on the internet right now. The bundle's worth 20 bucks. You get it for $4.99. It's a limited time only. Also, follow OCB on Instagram at OCB underscore USA to stay in touch with the natural wonder of OCB. It must be 21 to buy OCB papers and follow OCB social accounts. And now we're going to send it over to that madman, Terry Ryan. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy's been on the podcast before. He's all the way out in Newfoundland. Is that how you say it properly? Newfoundland, but I'll give you a break, but I don't know (laughs) if everybody else would. We actually went there for a Newfoundland extravaganza. We ended up taking that one down because I got a little silly that whole time. But uh, (laughs) welcome back to the Spit and Chicklets podcast for the third time, Terry Ryan. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate you guys having me on. I love everything you're doing. Biz, I had my money on you in the barbecue competition with Witter. <laughs> uh, I struggled. Hey, did you like the garlic started. aroma? Did you like the garlic aroma? I like where you were going. I let, You tried to talk your way into it. I don't think either one of you guys are big on the grill, I, I would bet. But, uh, you know, looked okay. Looked better than I thought it would, Biz. How, uh, how are you doing out there? I know you just got a visit from uh, Teddy Purcell, who was just back on the island. Yeah, I'm doing all right. Great to see Teddy. Um, uh, Teddy and I are pretty good buddies, and we share a lot of the same friends. So, And we went to a huge birthday bash from a guy who just loves to party, so it was an awesome time. And I'm having a good summer. My Penny Lane's mom is away in Labrador working at, on a, like a, a fishing lodge kind of resort. So I'm a single dad for the summer, and I got a lot on the go, so it's interesting to say the least. I'm coaching an un- under-11 girls soccer team. So take what you – and I'm running a bar. So there you go. There's two extremes. <laughs> Any snap show so far on the sidelines? I forget the movie that was with Will Ferrell when he had the full-blown tracksuit going on. Kicking and screaming. Was that it? It was called Kicking and Screaming? Kicking and Screaming, where he has Mike Ditka as his assistant coach. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you ever that seen that one, fun. Terry? Or are you more I of a have. Ladybugs kind of guy? No, no, I've seen it. I've seen – I was going to say – um you know, the first time I was on, I was so rushed and I was so excited. And as you know, I'm excitable. But um, I know R.A. has a huge love of movies. And if you could pass that along, he'll probably listen. But I really share his love and I love his insight. And I don't think he always gets the credit because you guys don't know what the fuck he's talking about. He's talking about classics like Taxi Driver and The Godfather and Rocky. And anyway, I... I I, I empathize with him because I've, it's always a tough crowd. He's going on and on about like the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you guys are like, what the fuck is that? Anyway. When we had Terry Ryan Sr. on, and, and when, even when I went out there, I, I got a good understanding of why you know so much about the classics, including the Beatles, who you have a massive love for, is you guys usually spend one time a week, because he only gets one day a week to booze. Yeah. Right, Terry Ryan Sr. And you guys spend your Friday nights watching like old music videos, old the DVDs, whatever it may be. And that's where you kind of got all your knowledge from all this old school stuff. Is when my dad came back from pro hockey, as you know, he loves hanging out with the boys. So he came back and he retired early. He was the first in his family to get a degree. So he got it. And I mean, you can check it out. He was wheeling and dealing. He had over 100 points in the eye. Still a prospect. And um, after having played a full year in the WHA and leading it in shorthanded goals. So his career was by no means even teetering off yet, but he had that degree. So he came home and he started playing senior hockey and he still, you know, I kind of know what it's like, but he was drinking way too much, like three, four nights a week. And, you know, up to like three and having to go to each missing days. Sounds like my playoff run this year. Well, basically, yes, yes, yes. But I've taken some time off since two or three year playoff run. So mom just had enough one day and then kicked him out. He moved to Toronto for a little bit. I went to see him. He, he found himself, so to speak, quote unquote. And he came back and he just said, look, I love boozing. I love the boys. And he said, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to give it up for good. If you can uh, give me one day a week. And if that, if I can't do that, then we can keep talking about, you know, never doing it again. But the, that was, that was when I was seven years old. He's been true to his word. And to this day on Fridays, he has beers. And, you know, at this point, a lot of my buddies, I mean, a lot of his, but a lot of my buddies, because it was where we always went. And I grew up is he used to be playing senior hockey or coaching. And he let me and my other buddies down there. 
as long as we played records from his collection. Uh, so, you know, over the years and, you know, the way up to that point, that was the eighties. So every record had like a book jacket with it and all the lyrics. And I mean, that's what I miss about albums and vinyl, although they're coming back or they're back, I guess, but you know what I mean? There was, there was a story behind each one and each song and even the order of the songs on each side meant something. Yeah. And we've kind of lost all that. So kinda even like though Kanye. Kind of forced, yeah, I mean, we're, well, we're forced. <laughs> it was forced on me, but, I, I certainly don't regret it. At the time, I don't no. think I realized how important it would be. A lot but... of regrets, just not that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There so, um, one, one of the one of the reasons that it, uh, it sparked me up to uh, get you on is I was almost chained on. We were doing this uh, Pink Whitney draft pre-draft anyway party, and uh, we were talking about uh, the, your infamous story about getting interviewed by Mike Milbury pre-draft. Now, Mike, you'll replay it for us. And this is from the last time I interviewed you back uh, back on your home soil there. So, Milbury, anyway, these guys are talking. All of a sudden, I hear these footsteps coming in from the adjoining room. And it's Mike Milbury. And he walks into the room, and he's kind of has an air of authority about him. And he throws down his papers, whatever it was, scouting book on the table. And he's talking. He's standing up. Everybody else now is sitting down. But he is about to take a seat at the end of the table across from me. And he says, yeah, well, I think you skate faster with the puck than without it. Now, I've been talking to these scouts, and they're asking me questions very cordially and respectfully. And he walks in, and he just starts talking. Like, you know, you skate faster with the puck than without it, like a, like some bully in grade 8, and I'm in grade 6 or something. I'm going, oh, yeah, I guess. Okay. I don't know if that's a cut either or it means something good. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I really don't yeah, know. I think that was good. Yeah, so I'm like, okay. And then he says, like, thanks, Milps. I wasn't sure, and I, I was still going, maybe he is stroking me off too. And, but then he goes, yeah, well, I think you got lucky against Wade Belak. There's a fight on YouTube, I fight Belak, and we only played him twice that year, and it was like Jerry Seinfeld, like when he, he, he races and he, he doesn't want to do it ever again because he won the race. I didn't want to fight Belak again. I fought him once, and it was a great fight, and it was talked about. And, of course, I don't have a death wish. So he says, if you fight him ten times, you're going to lose nine of them. That was lucky. Not that I beat him, but we had a good one. And I said, okay, but I didn't, and we had a good fight. And he said, it's a good thing Damon Lankow played with you all year. You wouldn't have had all those points. And I said, well, it's a good thing he fucking played with me. He wouldn't have had all those points. <laughs> You know, like, I know we both improved this so year. you're going back and forth. We're going there. back and forth, and now it's getting like he's cutting me up and I'm cutting him up, and there's no punchline. Like, this, this isn't a joke anymore. So he says, okay, tough guy. He said, I'm going to give you a scenario. He said, you're in Tri-Cities, and you and that Lankow kid, I think he called us hoodlums. He said, you and that Lankow kid have been out, and you're having a good time, and you bring some girls back, and all of a sudden, you break off with your girl and you go to her house. It's 10 to 11, but it's a 10-minute drive home and curfew's at 11. But she spreads her legs and says, fuck me, Terry. <laughs> he says, what do you do? I thought about it. I'm like, well, 10-minute drive home. I'm doing the math. 10-minute drive home. And you're not a math guy. No, no well, no. But I'm thinking about like what I actually would do, and I'm looking at myself going, 10-minute drive home, curfew's at 11. Girl wants to fuck me. Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> so I go... I'm going to, I take a sip of my water that's sitting there, and I call him Mr. Milby at this point. I said, well, well, Mike, I said, I fuck her for five minutes, and then I speed home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he says, get the fuck out of my office. And the other scouts are like, some guys are putting their head down, and they want to not laugh, but they're fucking, they're trying, and I know what's going on. I'm like, that was a fucking great answer. <laughs> but, so, but when I, go, when I turn around and I, I look up, the door opens, but it's Phil Esposito. So Phil Esposito's been standing there. I forget that they've they've played since they played with Boston Bruins. I guess in the late seventies. I kind of forget all of that. And he, Phil, is doing my last interview with Tampa Bay just next door. And so I follow him out. He goes, "Great fucking answer!" And he shuts the door. He goes, "What did you say again?" And I told him. He goes, "That's fucking unbelievable." He goes, "His only question to me," he says, "Sit down." So I go in the room with him and Tony Esposito, his brother. And he's he's obviously he's the GM of Tampa, so he's scouting for Tampa. Sits down, he goes, How far apart did Napoleon sleep from his wife? And I went, A bone apart? <laughs> and he said, Fucking right. So he goes, Terry, I'm not gonna draft you. You're not a good enough skater. I gotta be honest with you. He said, We're picking fifth, but I'm very interested in Damon Lankow. What kind of a guy is he? I said, Well, you know, he works hard and he you know, he he's often like treats the rookies when he goes, Terry, 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 what kind of a guy is he? Would you guys hang out? Does he stick up for you in all situations? 
I said, yeah, of course he does. He's one of my best friends. He goes, perfect. He said, you just won yourself a good story. And he, I, I sat there. I had a Diet Coke, and I listened to him tell me about the 1972 Summit Series for an hour. He just said, what do you want to hear? I said, I've always wanted to meet you. And I asked him about the Summit Series, about how he slipped, when, when, and all the Russians laughed at him, and how they turned that into a, com- a confidence booster. I swear to you, he t- he t- he, I was interviewing him for an hour, and then he let me go, and he said, perfect. And they ended up taking Damon Lankout number five the next day. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. But you ended up, when we talked today, telling me that you had another pre-draft story yeah and by the way i love that and if you ever talk to donor again say hi we used to be pretty good buddies you got drafted one pick behind him did you not yeah so everything he was talking about i identified with you were asking him you know where was he rated i remember for me i, I thought i was going to go anywhere from seven to twelve but but i knew i knew dallas were going to take me if, if i if i land if i went that late so i knew it wouldn't slip too far and with donor same sort of thing i, I think he said four to ten you know we all kind of knew and we were traveling around to do a lot of these pre-interviews. So you asked about the second draft story. So I'm not sure if they still do it, but the Washington Capitals used to fly people down, like a lot of people, not just the top five or six that they were interested in, um, but say, you know, I'd say 40 or 50 players in the draft wow. got flown down at some point. So there was, there was groups of us that went down. So, and people think, you know, I talk to now and, and, and they think that that really wasn't on the go then. But there was a little period that it was almost even too much. Like I got interviewed by almost every team. The only two teams that didn't interview me were Montreal and Detroit, if you can believe it. But some of those interviews, quote unquote, were like IQ tests um, and then the, the VO2 or whatever it might be. So what Washington do, would do is, was fly you down and they'd have you there for three days and you do two days of testing. And then you'd go out for a big dinner, everybody. Right. So. There was, I don't know if Donor was on my trip. I, I think he might have been. He'll, he'll at least know about all this. And I, I know I was there with Lankow. Brian Burrard was there. Iggy was there. Oh, wow. You guys had a big And there trip. was the, the particular player that I'm going to tell you about here. I can't use his name because he asked me not to for my book. There's another great plug. It's my, you can find all this in Fights, Film, and Folklore, which came out in October 2020. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, th- this particular player, asked me not to use his name because he's still involved in the hockey world. It, it's a funny story. He said, just if, if you can. So anyway, I'm going to call him Lefty Fitzgibbons. Okay. So I knew Lefty Fitzgibbons already. And he was a tough cat. I tell you that is a tough cat. And we'd actually been in a fight at, at one point during my career. I don't want to give too much away. Oh no. Everybody's been looking up hockey DB now trying to put the yeah, pieces there's together. So many, it's going to be hard to figure out. What's but, his name uh, again? Lefty and, what? Hey, it, Lefty Left, Fitzgibbons, I'm going to call Lefty him. Lefty Fitzgibbons. Get the T-shirts so, printed, Grinelli. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we go down, and it's a great time. It's um, The draft was July 8th. It wasn't too far before that. So it was probably, I don't know, I'm guessing the beginning of June maybe. So we get down, um, stopped in Toronto with a few of the guys, had a good night, went down. And, and again, we're all 18 here, right? So we get down, and we know that in the morning – I think at nine or 10 in the morning, I know it's before noon, but it wasn't like six and we had to start doing these tests. So what it is, is we had to go meet Jack button, Craig's father. I think he's passed away now. He was a huge scout. Um, and he's actually like a legendary scout. And I, I don't know if his name has gotten lost in the annals of time here in hockey history. I hope it hasn't because he was a real good guy too, real respectable guy. And we knew we had to go in and meet with him first. And then after that, uh, it was a IQ test sort of thing. If a train is leaving from this point and then another one's leaving from this point, they're going so fast, that kind of thing, like SAT type stuff. Oh shit. And then I know. And then we had, um, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 and, and, I mean, who, who even wanted to do that anyway, but then it was like, um, I forget. I think they call it the Warshak test. It was like, you know, here's, here's a picture. What do you see? Right. And I mean, Every time my answers were like, well, I see a guy who's defending all his teammates, right? Even if it was a, <laughs> even if it was a flower on the wall, man. I mean, what am I going to say? What the fuck am I going to say? I so, see me uh, being home for curfew on time yeah, and uh, being a really oh, good yeah, example for me. the young guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. so, uh, and then after it all, we had finally had some physical stuff and most of it was like reacting to a, to a computer screen, but I'll, I'll get into that. So the night before there's a place right next to the hotel we're staying at and it's 
it's, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever been to a place Jillian's in the States. There's one in Boston. At least there was last time I was there. And it's like pool. You know, it's a like fun and games kind of place, but you can get a lot of different kind of beers and stuff. So we went in. And again, we're all 18, but we all get fake IDs. And um, we, um, we, we sit down at the table. And, and some guys are kind of nervous, but some of us had played, played against each other before. And, you know, so it doesn't take long before we're all hanging out, like a hockey dressing room, right? You know yeah. the way it goes. And a lot of us are alpha males, and we're that guy in the dressing room. You know, we're biz kind of thing, you know, like in the dressing room. So everybody wants to play the jukebox. Yes, there was a jukebox. Everybody wants to... Um, you know, kind of be the life of the party, but not in a bad way. So it's awesome. So we're kind of trying to outdo each other. So this lefty looks over at me and he goes, come on, Noof. He goes, I heard you can drink. He said, any, uh, <clears throat> I almost gave it away. But he said, you know, guys from my league can put them away a lot, a lot better than a Newfoundlander. You just, you guys are living off that rep because you're so happy. Go lucky. I said, okay. So I said, okay, lefty. So we sat down. We started with a couple of double rum and Cokes. And I'm like, now we, we got to meet Jack Button in the morning, you know, so, and I know Jack, even though he's a legend and everything, he's, I say old school, I'm kind of going into the kind of hockey player he wanted. I'm sure he didn't want us boozing the night before that, but whatever, all of us were on it. You know what I mean? It was like one for all boys, like yeah. I'm in, you're in, everybody. Yeah, nobody's got the advantage on the, on the, on the cross your eye, seeing the ship the test. Totally. And other people went down and they didn't have that experience. So I was glad I went with the right group. So, um, Lefty comes over. So I go over to the bartender. I said, I'm going to order something that you've never had before. Bring it on. Bring it on, Noof, he says. <laughs> so I go over to the bartender. I'm like, listen, dude, bring over 10 shots of vodka and 10 shots of water. And you're going to give the vodka to Lefty, and I'm going to take the water. And I'll pay for it all right now, so it's not to be obvious. So I, I do. I come over, and he looks at me. He goes, okay, Noof, let's do this. And we sat down. And I'm thinking, like, maybe four or five in, he's getting real googly-eyed, right? And I'm kind of sober enough. I feel pretty good. <laughs> so we finish him off, and he's just buried. He's done. Uh, he orders another drink, kind of, trying, to, trying to kind of be macho. But we go back to the hotel. Now, he's my roommate. So we get back to the hotel. And again, I've had 10 shots of water. I had a slice slab of pizza on the way out. He's zonked, loaded. As soon as we get in the room, he passes down face, he passes out face down. And I'm sitting there watching TV for an hour or two. Perfect. So I wake up in the morning. I got my alarm set, go in the bathroom. I get all ready full on. Like, you know, I take a full hour just to get perfectly ready. And then I go out and I shake lefty and I say, lefty, we're late, we're late. So, which we're not, we're still an hour early. So he gets up, freaks out. He runs in the bathroom to get ready, but he slips on the water and hits his hand on the toilet bowl. And now he's leaking. He's got six or seven uh, zips over the, or ended up over the eye. So he's cut and I'm going, Jesus. Okay. Lefty. Look, I was only kidding. So he's, he's pissed off, but whatever. I'm his buddy. And he, he knows it's a joke. And he goes, New one, lefty, nothing. New one, lefty, nothing. I said, okay, two, really, because I got your shit face. But anyway, here we go. So we get there, and I, no one really wants to go first, but I, I want to get first. I, I want to get it out of the way. I'm the kind of guy, if I knew I was fighting, I want to happen the first yeah, shift. Yeah, get I don't want, you know what I mean? What it's, it's the same feeling. I hate the right? weight. You hate the weight, right? Like, like Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part, right? So I'm, I don't want that. So I want to go first. So I get in there and I say, hello, Mr. Button. How you doing? And he said, Terry, I've heard a lot about you. Your old man was a good player. He said, I know you come from a good family. He said, what, what did you do last night? I said, well, Mr. Button, you know, I, we went out and we had a bite to eat and nothing too serious. I got back and I said, I read a bit of the Bible. You know, I grew up in Catholic school and, uh, you know, I'm not going to claim to be like overly religious, but it really brings me down to earth once in a while to read a good excerpt out of the Bible. <laughs> but let's move on from that, which, again, was complete bullshit. <laughs> so we go through the interview and I don't really remember my interview with Jack other than I was asking him about other players. Okay, he scouted a friend of mine, John Slaney. Um, so uh, who went to Washington, maybe I think yeah, he's, with the, he's with the Coyotes organization. He's coaching now. Yeah, I mean, legend, right? 30 goals yeah. a year as a D-man in, in, the, in the A. Yeah. Uh, and he's got quite a few NHL games, too. John went ninth overall. Um, I, I, I went eighth, yeah. So, <laughs> no, so <big> anyway. Deal. <laughs> no. So, let's get back to this the, the Jack Button. So, lefty, I go in, 
do my interview, I come out. And it might have been Burrard. Someone went in between us, and he's just, as as we're waiting those 10 or 15 minutes, he's out there, and, and there's a bunch of guys outside waiting. And he's he's sweating. He's nervous. I mean, he's hung over. You can smell the booze. <laughs> so I said, I made the mistake. I said, Lefty, I went in there, and I acted all straight up. And Jack, all he wants to do, he just wants to talk to one of the boys. So I said, you know, take what you will from that. So by the time he goes in and we all, we, we got cups up to the, we're, we're listening at the door and trying to hear what we can. And as soon as he goes in, he goes, how the fuck are you doing, Jack? <laughs> like, wrong, 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 wrong. And then Jack, same, same, same lead to the question. What did you guys do last night? He's like, well, I got fucking shit face. <laughs> so, so, uh, so. You are a fucking asshole. Oh, oh yeah. So, man. <laughs> Then we come out and he soon realizes, I mean, Jack totally was cool with him and everything, but he realized halfway through that that's probably not the angle I need to go to. But anyway, he comes out. Now I went in and I told Jack, I said, Jack, that was half my fault. Right? I, I said, I'm, I'm toying with him. But he comes out, he says, lefty or noof two, lefty, nothing. So, okay, all good. I'm like, look, lefty, we're cool. We're buddies here. And I love you, you know that. So I'm done for the rest of the time. And I'm going to tell them all that it's my fault. So, um, which kind of doesn't happen the rest of the day. It happened at the end of the trip. But anyway, so we're going through. Same thing. Lefty's really nervous. We go in to do that Warshak test or whatever it's called. And we got one thing left to do, which it, it was on the computer, but it was like reacting to, like say there was a ball bouncing on the screen and we were all standing on these pads and we had to jump to the rhythm of the ball bouncing. It would speed up, it would slow down, right? And then it would say, you know, part of the test was like, uh, say when a red dot comes up and the word blue might come up with red in red Yeah, letters. yeah, I've done that before. You know what I mean? It was all that stuff. But it's a pad. It's like a pad that we're hitting with our hand. Or when we have to jump, it's a pad under our feet. So I went, I remember it was, it was pretty good. You know, a bunch of us, when I, I don't really remember, let's say we rolled up between 70, 70 and 80%. I don't really recall again, but lefty at this point was so nervous that he's over there and he's thinking about it. And, he, and I uh, honestly, honestly, I wanted to let him go first. I hadn't even hatched this plan yet. So, but anyway, cause, and there's a bunch of us doing it at once. So this is like three groups. So my group goes, okay, you know, 70 might've been the best or worse than 80 might've been the best. You know, there's not, so anyway, Lefty gets up with his group. So now we're all behind. So Lefty's looking at the screen, okay? And all the people, the scouts and everything, that, and there's only two or three of them there that are looking at the results. I mean, every single scout's not in the room. Jack Button's long gone at this point. We're with the people that are doing the physical testing. So anyway, they're not looking at us, and all the boys kind of left. So me and a couple more just stick around. So wouldn't you know it, when they do the reflex stuff, when Lefty's jumping in the air, I'm behind him and I'm hitting the pad with my own foot. When he gets met, so he couldn't have been doing any worse. Okay, so Lefty Lefty gets like fourteen percent. Like no one, no one got less than fifty. Like it was so so bad. You are <laughs> fucking brutal, man. Listen, you're an asshole. And not only that, he wasn't a high rated guy. Most people there were rated in the first or second round. So. I'm not saying he didn't get drafted either, um, but, you know, if they were interested. So anyway, that all happens. That all happens. Okay. So I end up telling everybody, look, it's all me. It's my fucking fault. Lefty's a good buddy and everything. So that kind of smooths itself over. But the next season we're back in junior and we're playing lefty's team. Okay. So lefty, when I'm, at, when I'm playing at home, Again, I don't want to give it away, but there's a, it's a large league. A lot of people get drafted from the West back then. We're playing their team. The first time we're playing them in Tri-Cities, they were playing in Seattle the night before. And I took this one. I can't take credit from an old teammate named Aaron Bow. You might want to have him on sometime. So he's an, an absolute legend. Ask anybody my age in the league, Aaron Bow. So Bozy used to do this. So he told me he did it. So... I called the hotel ahead of time. There was only one that the teams used in Tri-City at the time. And especially um, there was a big car show in town. So there was none available. So I called and canceled all their rooms. <laughs> I said, this is so-and-so from so-and-so team. 
and you don't need it. I said, like, we're coming in. We're just going to leave and we're going to move and go on to Spokane that night. So they got in and they had no hotel rooms. So as it's about midway through the first and I'm and no one really knew what happened. And I looked over at the bench. I go, hey, Lefty, how'd you sleep last night? And he starts thinking about it, thinking about it. And then he looks up and he goes, no. And he jumped over the bench to try to fight me. And he fell down on his face. And that was it. He got four minutes for jumping over the bench. And I never did have to fight him. <laughs> anyway. And to- you are. Hey, hey that is like did you ever get any consequence for canceling their rooms no dude i didn't i don't think anybody even knew it people were pissed off yeah i mean i knew i went a little bit too far with that one i knew i did that that was a little bit too far i only told people that i even did that maybe a month later like no one really knew what i was talking about and lefty might have assumed it but i don't think anybody thought i would have gone that far i didn't hide much from my teammates even there was only about five of them that knew but there was a couple. Yeah. That is uh, that is as old school as it gets. That shit doesn't happen anymore. And folks, you can hear more stories like that on uh, Tales with TR. It's uh, what what podcast networks it with? It's with the Hockey Podcast Network. Uh, I'm part of that umbrella. Uh, yeah, Tales with TR. You can get it on pretty much every platform that I know of. That's awesome. Uh, so so we got to hear the the last NHL shift one, and then we'll let you go because we got to we got to save some of your ones to get you on in the future as well. Hey, no problem. And I really do appreciate it. Uh, it's a great platform and you guys are good buddies. Um, okay. So this one is also in my latest book called uh, fights, film and folklore. And um, yeah, I guess I'll just start it. So I, it's 1998, 99 season. Okay. And at the beginning of the season, there was Scott Thornton, there was Shane Corson and Benoit Brunet, all left-handed shooting forwards that were all playing left wing at the time and they were all hurt. So I got to stay up. I, I had the feeling I would be sent down. You know, how you get that feeling. I mean, I was probably told, I don't really remember, but I remember knowing that, you know, I'm here for a few games. So they kept me and Dave Morissette up, Moose Morissette, real tough guy, only played a short amount of time in the NHL, but gotten some great fights including what I'm going to tell you about. So we're up. So the first four games, five games go by, and I'm warming up. I think I might have dressed for one game. I don't think I got a shift. And the other ones, I'm warming up. But again, I'm not pissed off at this. I, I'm young. I'm in the NHL. At the very least, I get front row seats to an NHL game. I was still in that mode, right? So, um, and just pumped to be there. And I loved warm up. I, I just loved it. You know, I get to wear no bucket, skate around, listen to some good tunes in the Bell Center, right? Yeah. What's the worst Special. case scenario? I love I love warming up in the Bell Center. Yeah. Uh, there was not there was nothing like it. You felt like it was already like seventy five percent full and you felt like you were the center of the hockey universe. Totally. And that feeling doesn't get old. So people ask, must have been disappointing not to play. I'm like, Well, maybe looking back like there was a level, but I, I don't really recall like I don't recall having a bad time and warm up doesn't get talked about enough. You're skating around with NHL players. You're in the center of the hockey universe, listening to great tunes and then going in to get a hot tub. And then out after the game, they have a great meal and talk to some women. I mean, really, I mean, you know, first world problems getting upset at that. So, <laughs> so the game, so me and Moose, and we figure we're not playing, although we're playing Chicago, and I know Moose might get out there because Pro, Probert's skating around, Mark Jansen's, Cam Russell, that's their third line, and there there's three, and, and I'm not even mentioning anybody else. So um, we get out there, and Moose and I, we get the feeling, yeah, I mean, we're the grocery sticks, so we don't have a line, right? We're the two extra. So we're playing the clock game. I don't know if you've ever played it. You know, you just, we had 50 bucks on each, each spin of the clock. So if, you know, we just pick a number between one and 10. And if it lands on that as the last number, then you get 50 bucks where, you know, it's simple enough. So I'm like three, 400 bucks in, I'm up, I'm loving life. Um, and Probert comes by the bench and I kid you not, I kid you not. Now I know. Wait, wait, back it up. You're you're play, you're literally gambling during the game as to when when the whistle goes and the clock stops. You're on the bench gambling with one of your teammates as opposed to what the number is yes. going to be. What, and you're one up- of your guests, one of your former guests, David Ling, taught me that game. Yes. So just to yeah, we we would either. So that would be your booze money for after the game. 
Totally. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't the first time I played. So we were into it. And again, I'm like three or 400 bucks at least up on the clock game. So I'm pretty pumped, but Moose was chirping and he was chirping guys coming by the bench. So anyway, Probert came by the bench and he said, Hey Ryan, my, my rum and Coke gets more ice than you do. So, and I know that's an old regurgitated line, but Bob Probert was saying it and it just meant something. And he was off the booze even then. It just seemed really funny. So I stood up and, you know, I know, I know Moose wants to go. And so I'm just like, Hey, Mr. Probert, it wasn't me. Everybody laughed. Okay. <laughs> I've done my thing. Right. I'm George. Just, okay, boys. Hey, let's have one after you. <laughs> so anyway, Moose, the dead man who hit me with the salt yeah. shaker. Moose, uh, Vigneault comes down and gives him the tap and he jumps over. Now I kid you not. I kid you not. I'm watching it with my own eyes. It's probably on YouTube. I haven't seen it in a long time. I saw it on a video. Moose fights Probert in front of our bench. Boom. Hits him. He goes down. He's leaking over. The, that's why I can't believe Moose only played like 11 games. One of the games is this game. He took out Bob Probert right in front of the bench. Go to YouTube after this. I hope it's on there. At the very least, you can look up on the internet when it happened. He hit him and he Probert goes down to one knee and then he has to leave the game. I, I couldn't believe it so anyway the period ends i'm in the dressing room i'm looking over at moose and he figures he's not getting out again i know i'm not getting out i just didn't play for the whole first period so i look over i'm like holy shit moose are you fucking kidding me <laughs> like he was trying to keep a straight face but he couldn't believe it either you know we're like oh my god <laughs> so um we go back out on now we go back out so now i figure i haven't got a shift in the first period and I'm just doing the math. Every time that ever happened, I'm not getting out there again. And I don't know anybody else, unless it goes to like eight, nothing. But if it stays close, I don't think I'm getting out. So on the way out, I look at our uh, trainer, um, Pierre Ouellette. Uh, they call him Steamer. And I go, uh, Steamer, can you grab me a couple of Shen shows uh, with the hot dogs, right? Because Yeah, again, world I'm famous hot dogs. Yeah, you know the way it is when you play hockey. You eat at like 11 or 12. And then you don't eat it. Now it's like eight o'clock at night. So I haven't eaten in eight hours. And, and it affects you more if you're not playing in the midst of the game. If you're in, if you're going, you're going, you don't even think about it. But I sat on the oh. bench too. I would get so fucking hungry between periods even, I, but they would have the power bars and shit back then, yeah. obviously at the bell center. So you send them up to get you a couple hot dogs. Well, I, we did power bars and stuff, I guess, or something close to a Gatorade bars. But I, again, I really don't think I'm getting out there though. I don't. And I'm starving and I love those. I love them. If it had been anywhere else, don't know that I would order a hot dog, but the Shen shows in the Bell Center are next level. Yeah. So I'm going, and Saku Koivu, um, I don't know if you saw this a lot, but he used to drink Coca-Cola in between periods, and I'd, I'd never, ever seen that. I know I, Chara had did it a couple of years ago, but other than those, two, maybe it's a thing. Uh, I certainly had never seen it, but I, I love Coca-Cola. So I grab one, I grab two, they're in little Gatorade cups, and I throw them in a water bottle. So my water bottle going out there, got Coca-Cola in it. And I say to Steamer, get me a couple of hot dogs. I give him a $10 bill. So he goes, gets them, brings them to me. This took all of like 30 seconds, right? So but by the time the pucks drop, so I got a hot dog right here, right? And I, I'm hiding it in my glove. And, I'm, and I know the game's on Hockey Night in Canada. So I'm taking a bite. I'm doing it. And I'm washing it down with Coke. So it's all good. And Moose, anyway, so I start perspiring i'm really sweating and i'm going man i don't think i feel good like something's going on and moose says what i said well i said i i, I ate those hot dogs but it might have been after the first hot dog anyway i was just like i'm sweating i go my eyes like my eyes are killing me man they're burning and he goes oh the boys put a535 on your helmet before before the game in warm-up didn't you know it i'm like i didn't i don't wear my helmet in warm-up Warm-up is my sanctuary, Moose. I don't wear my fucking helmet in warm-up. And the first period, I guess, I didn't get out there. I'm totally dry. I don't, I'm not one of those guys that just sweats. But now the hot dog made me start sweating a bit. So now I'm like, oh, geez. And I'm wiping my eyes. And I'm starting to get, like, my eyes are burning. I've got A535 in there. Rex or Mark Recchi or one of them guys. So, you know, and again, I'm not mad. I'm just like, oh, God, I'm in the middle of an NHL game. Like, So not only that, they know that, too. So the boys are behind me. And I thought everybody knew, so I was definitely wasn't going to get out there now. So my, my feet are killing me because I've been sitting out for so long, I got lace bite. So you know, when I say so long, I don't mean that day. I mean, like, this is after a month or two of 
putting on my gear, going out and not playing. So ironically, you, you, I got more injured than if I'd been out there playing like Weber in the playoffs. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing. My, my total, and I don't know if you've had lace bite, but it's no, still it's awful. I, I wear those bunga pads. So I'm there and I'm going to Moose. I'm going, man, I'm, but they're fucking killing me. And he goes, ah, don't worry. Just take them off. Take them off. I'm like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll loosen up the top two rungs. So I loosen up my skates. Another like eight minutes goes by. I'm not playing. So we're playing the clock game and then we get sick of that. And I think like we cut it out at like 500 bucks or something. And I've, I've, I've won. So I'm pretty pumped other than that. My eyes are burning and I got lace bite. So then Moose says, well, what do you want to be when you get older? And I'm like, I don't know. What are you talking about? So, you know, we would talk about the weirdest things. So then we start going down the list of things. I'm like, I don't know, maybe a lawyer. I don't know. I probably would like to do that. I go, maybe something in the music industry. Now there's a game going on now and I'm completely, completely, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tuned out of it. So Moose says, I want to be an elephant hunter. And I said, an elephant hunter, why would you want to be that? And he's like, I swear to you, he's like, well, well where are the elephants going to hide? And I'm like, holy fuck like this is an nhl game. and, and I'm, I'm laughing though and moose got a way about him and he, he here he is asking me about elephant hunting and he got blood all over his hands from just fighting bob probert um i just ate a shan show and, and a co it just and i'm on the canadians bench with like john bellavo behind me at the canadians games as always the legends are like right yeah. behind you breathing down your neck you know it's a it's a weird place like that so so i'm sitting there wouldn't you fucking know it wouldn't you know it Ryan McCleary Poulin, you're up. And I look over and I thought Vigno was in on the joke. I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. So I do up the top rung of my skate. I'm, I'm, I'm wiping the sweat away from my eyes, which is only making it worse. And I'm thinking about elephants. The, the last, uh, ideally, I go on the ice, we win the face off, and I get the fuck off. I get a game played and like 10 seconds of ice time. That's the other thing. If you don't get out there, it's not a game yeah, played. That, yeah. so at least I'm going to get a game played, right? So <laughs> that's all I'm thinking. So I go, and sure enough, McCleary, Trent McCleary ended up getting his career, career cut short because he got a slapper in the throat. But, I mean, I'm not cutting him. He was like the Rudy Rudiger of hockey. He tried hard. He was a little guy. He used to hit everything. Really, really tried hard. And I knew he would fight, but he's not very tough. Patrick Poulin. First overall, I think, or second overall. Um, he was traded to Montreal, kind of like Joanne, trying to get him going a little bit. And uh, and I know he kind of would, but he's not a, you know, I, I'm I'm a middleweight. I'm a something weight. The other guys just don't fight that much. So I know that of the people going out there, I'm the guy with the most fighting experience. They're older, but I got the most fighting experience. So we go out against, sure enough, Jansen's Probert Russell. And I'm going, are you kidding me? My Honestly, my skates aren't even done up. And I, I really can't open my eyes for more than five seconds without blinking. So I'm looking. And you know the period where the linesman is about to drop the puck and everything goes silent. You can hear anything. You can hear a pin drop, even the fans. It's just a weird time of sports. So he's got the puck in his hand. It's silent. And Cam Russell, great Atlantic Canadian, I've since talked to. He says, Hey, Ryan, does your coach know you're out here? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got to say, that's pretty fucking good. Right? I hadn't heard that one before. And I'm like, that is pretty fucking good. So I'm thinking now, you know what? Fuck it. But as I go to do it, I mean, Russell, and I know he's only fucking around, but, you know, I'm thinking, what am I here for anyway? So the puck ends up, I don't, I don't go right at him and fight. The puck ends up behind the net, and someone falls on it anyway. This, this, this one's definitely on YouTube, so judge as you will. But uh, I, I kind of get wrapped up, and Russell comes in. He's a big guy, but he's not Probert. He, you know, he probably yeah, is yeah, big. Yeah, we know. You know, Probert's Probert. So he, he wraps me up. And Probert is spinning around. You can see Probert grab me. He looks, he grabs again, and he's trying to get there. And he's not even really that mad. He just wants to grab someone that'll fight. And I'm going, fuck that. So Russell's in front of me. I'm going, fuck it. We're just going to go. Process of elimination. Let's just go. I don't want to fight him. So anyway, we start going, and we're going pretty good. And I know that Russell's a tough guy. It ends up getting, I think, like highlighted the night on one of the sports. Like, hey, this is a good fight. We're going boom, boom. And I don't even throw many lefts. I go back. Boom, 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 boom. Wicked fight. It ends. He looks in my ear. Way to go, man. Good fight. We go over to the penalty box. 
He says, um, hey, from Atlanta, Canada, hey? He said, so am I. Wishes me luck. Had a great conversation. And I tell him about my eyes and everything. He's laughing. And then I look next to the bench, and there's a couple of rockets there. I mean, I'm guessing they're probably uh, strippers, right? So I look at the scorekeeper, and I'm like, can I borrow your pen? and a piece of paper. So they give me a pen and a piece of paper. And I, anyway, I write on my hand and the paper, I write my phone number and I stick right, right in the middle of an NHL game. And I, I put it up on the thing and the girl's <laughs> looking at me. She's nodding. She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. After the game, I kid you not. Now I figure out after the boys had, you know, boys had tickets. I think Jab or Pat and Jablonski or one of them had these girls come into the game. I didn't realize that part of it, but in any case, they met us at a place called Da Vinci afterwards. Moose had the big fight. I did not know it was going to be my last shift in the NHL, but I'm kind of glad now looking back. I mean, I wish I had a few more hundred games, but it was worth it was worth not having another couple. Wow, as long you're going to sell a couple more game. hundred books, yep. Terry. Her name was I'll tell Heather, you that. And, and I closed the deal that night, and she's still my friend. Holy yeah. fuck. <laughs> anyway, that that's is... the story of my last NHL shift. Terry, you are fucking one of a kind, man. That is, uh, that sure beats me blowing out my ACLs. I'll tell you that. <laughs> hey, G, <laughs> hey, Grinelli, I feel like a fucking peasant now compared to Terry. But uh, hey, we're gonna we're gonna get you back on down the road, man. We appreciate it, it as always. And uh, tell your old man I said hello. I certainly will. I'll tell him. And uh, he, de- he he told me to pass that along to both you guys. And by the way, guys, I'll never forget you guys coming over here to Newfoundland. I really appreciate it. And uh, in the future, maybe maybe Teddy, maybe George Street Festival or something like that. But, we'll have to uh, do a Newfoundland extravaganza part two, and I won't dr- I won't drink as much and I won't smoke as much dope. Or and maybe we could re-release the footage or at least the stuff that I didn't embarrass myself on. Hey man, I had no problem with it. I appreciate you guys coming. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, it was awesome. Terry, you're also a ball hockey legend. We got the street uh, Barstool Street Hockey Tournament coming up this week. Any advice for the Barstool team or any of the ball hockey players out there? And moving wow. forward, when the, when the border situation ends up figuring itself out, you're going to join our ball hockey squad. We're going to need I, a ringer. I'd love to do that. So are you guys playing on a rink with the regular international rules, or is it you just – like we don't know that. So Terry. yeah, so we're just we're we're the roller team, but we have a full tournament of ball hockey players. So any advice for them? Huh. Ball hockey. Well, ball hockey is a lot harder to play defense than ice hockey because you got to follow people around. Advice. Um, don't. If I had one piece of advice, don't waste your energy. It's a hard sport, and it's the summertime. Even if it's indoors, you're you're going to have to drink a lot of water and don't waste your energy. You mean Pink Whitney, right? Pink Whitney. Congrats on that too, boys. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, it's a number one selling drink at our bar too, by the way. Oh, what's your bar? uh tj's well it's tj's pub on george street um during the pandemic uh, my buddy was didn't know what to do with it he owns another couple Mm -hmm. bars so i took it over with a couple of friends and we're doing all right of course it's all the uh, you know it's all the hockey guys go there it used to be called turkey joe's lots of people are going to listen to this that used to play in the ahl and it was the ahl bar turkey joe's now it's tj's pub almost the exact same place well we'll be there at uh, george street festival one of these years and we'll have maybe we'll throw a ball hockey tournament there Hey, the sky's the limit. Who knows? We can brainstorm. Buddy, thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. Love you guys. Thanks. Big thanks to Terry Ryan for joining us once again. It's been a minute since we had him on, Biz. He's uh, certainly an interesting character. Uh, First, though, we want to let you know that at Labatt, they don't care if you're good or bad at most things in life. They only care if you're good at beer, being yourself, and not pretending to be someone you're not. And if you are, they're good with you. After all, if you choose Labatt Blue Light, you're good at the most important thing there is, beer. We already know you're good at watching hockey. Be good at beer, too, with pristine Canadian Pilsner Labatt Blue Light. We're going to be working with Labatt Blue all year, and we have some exciting content coming up, so grab a pack and enjoy. I know there's no hockey left, but that doesn't mean you still can't enjoy some Labatt Blue or Labatt Blue Light. All right, boys, just a couple more transactions and notes to get to. Uh, Biz, you already mentioned Vancouver bought out Jake Vertanen. He had one year left on his deal. The buyout's going to cost Vancouver uh, five hundred grand the next two years. It'll be a fifty thousand dollar hit this year, uh, five hundred thousand dollar hit next year. Uh, we mentioned before he, there was some sexual misconduct allegations they serviced in May. They're still being investigated by Vancouver police and the team. Uh, Vertanen has denied the allegations, so I don't know how much of this is hockey related, how much is, is this situation. But either way, he's been bought out. 
Uh, as expected, the Rangers bought out Tony D'Angelo. We knew this was going to happen back when they basically kicked him off the team earlier this season. He had one year left that's going to cost the Rangers $883,000 for two years. There'll be cap hits of $383,000, uh, then $883,000 the second year. I would imagine somebody will scoop him up. Uh, also, we want to send congrats out to Colorado forward Matt Calvert. He retired after 11 NHL seasons with Colorado and Columbus. Uh, congrats to Matt, and also congrats to Pittsburgh defenseman Yannick Weber, who retired after 13 NHL seasons. He also spent time at Montreal, Vancouver, and Nashville as well. And uh, we want to extend uh, our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Mac uh, Motsko. Um, he passed away after an automobile crash on Saturday night. Uh, he was the son of University of Minnesota coach Bob Motsko, and he spent the last season with New Mexico of the North American Hockey League. Uh, just awful news we got over the weekend, and we just, again, want to send our deepest condolences to his family, friends, and extended Minnesota family. Just just terrible news to, to hear over the weekend. Um, we were awfully sorry to hear that. Um. Okay, boys, let's see. Uh, we'll get into the extracurricular stuff here. Um, what did you have, Biz? I know you had some of your wacky notes as usual down here. What do you even watch? Well, I was going to say uh, Nicholas Charmelson as well. It's rumored that he's going to be retiring. Probably one of the best defensive defensemen, at least of our generation. Three Stanley Oh, in the Cup. past 15 got- years, dude. Yeah, I would say he's definitely up there. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's been announced Officially, Craig Morgan, who does all the, the beat reporting for the Arizona Coyotes around our area, he he mentioned that he talked to him and that was the case. So I guess I'll wait till they make it official. But if that is the case, a, a difficult loss for the Coyotes. And I mean, for anyone in the league, man, looking to add a guy who's just an absolute fucking warrior in the back end, block shots, plays through pain, great example in the locker room, brings it every single night. Um, just an insane work ethic. So uh, if, if this is the end, buddy, what a fucking run. Enjoy it. And what, and what a tough way to make a living playing hockey like he did. Oh, yeah. Just, oh, I, I don't think the, the Blackhawks win those three cups without him. Just one of those un, unsung hero type players. You look back on that dynasty and you, you think this guy every single night laid it on the line. He blocked shots. He played hard. He was physical. And what you said, Biz, he just showed up and did his work quietly. So in no surprise whatsoever, guys who do know him and have played with him, he just will just kind of sail away into the night. There's not a big announcement. There's not a pompous, uh, no, you know, a loud, loud retirement ceremony. He's just the way he went, went about playing is the same way he's leaving. So what a career. Um, I think if, I mean, I think if there's a Lady Bing award, I think they should switch it up for the Norris and maybe make a, an offensive defenseman award and maybe a defensive defenseman award. No, moving forward at yeah, some talk, point. We've talked about this on the show in the past, you know, have a, the, the body like the or best award. shut down D man in the league. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it, I feel like it's been separated over time as like this kind of like you look at the points, mind yeah. you, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these good young players like the Kale McCars and the, and the, and the Adam Foxes, these guys can not only play very solid defense, but could also drive offensive numbers and including like possession, which is also extremely important. But there has to be a, you know, there has to be some acknowledgement other than maybe a shout out on a fucking podcast for doing 15 years of what he did for crying out loud. Maybe, um, maybe the paychecks help. Maybe like you could call it this, like Scott Stevens. He could get an award named after him. No, fucking right. Could That's Scott a great Stevens win a Norris trophy. I don't know. What do you guys they, think? I'm going to look it up quick. Yes or no? I would say no. I say no. Cause they got obsessed with the points so much with. With uh, with that award, he's got three. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Uh, NHL All Rookie Team All Star Game. He won the Conn Smythe. He never won a Norris. So let's get the Scott Stevens Memorial Trophy awarded every year to the best shutdown. He's still alive. Wit. We don't want to kill him off. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) if it's if it's Memorial Award, does that mean he's dead? Generally speaking, yeah. Oh shit, yeah. yeah. That's sorry, that's a, Scott. That's well, a, he's alive. Right, so the Scott <laughs> Stevens, the Scott Stevens Award, then. Yeah, yeah that works. I mean, you yeah, idiot. Super Nintendo Shamelson. He was probably the most unheralded player on that Chicago dynasty. I mean, he, you know, he did so many good things right out there. He was a key key part of that squad, no doubt about it. All right, boys. Um, I was gonna I was gonna talk yeah. quickly about the Ben Affleck and J Lo business going on online. This is an absolute fucking shit show. Just to oh. circle it back, he, they're actually back up in Vancouver because J Lo's shooting, and that was actually the 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 spot where Ben ended up get busted. 
because he ended up taking down a strippers from Brandy. So they're back together, completely rekindled. The paparazzi is absolutely flying off, and they're just giving the double barrel to Alex Rodriguez right now. He's, he's playing bongos on her ass once again like you did that video 20 years ago that's I mean, not it, a bad that's not a bad dumper to be playing the bongos no, on no, either no, jesus it's a nice christ dumper. that's She's dumper. 52 years old oh yeah. my goodness so, yeah she did a little instagram video she looks, i'm still i'm still jenny from the black i used to I, have a little now i have a lot she's got she had a couple of kids too didn't she with mark anthony back in yeah, the day yeah, yeah mark. i mean she what, looks what's, absolutely what, phenomenal. You were just gonna say, "You could be my hero, baby." Is that him? No, that's Bob Marley. But- <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, bitch. <laughs> um, um, also, um, also, uh, I, I had global warming slash uh, climate change written down because it has been crazy oh, all summer long. God, it, it, it's been rain. The, uh, Arizona had the most rain in a twenty-four hour period by double the amount last week. Trees were falling over. Because the, the you know they're not it's not used to absorbing any of the water it usually just stays pretty firm right so it got so heavy with the rain the trees are just falling over and Pacific Northwest has faced heat waves like they've never seen highest on record in BC more are just as many or uh, maybe a, just just a tiny smaller amount eight hundred people died in the heat wave in BC that have that died from COVID the entire time COVID was alive and well. Well, I know it's still kind of going, but during the the high time. So that just because there's not much uh, there's not much AC out there. I mean they never dealt with these types of temperatures. Yeah. So there's no reason to put AC in buildings. Wow. So, AC there isn't like a lot of places don't have air conditioner in Vancouver. No. They're like the building that I I'd bought in when I had a condo there didn't have AC. I would I would say maybe 50% of the buildings there maybe just because it's, it, I mean, back, well, you look back 30 years ago, it probably got as high as, uh, I don't know, maybe 35 degrees Celsius. Times two plus 30, that, that's 100. That's 100 degrees. Yeah, we'll have to double check that. Uh, well, maybe, oh, no, check no, what? excuse no, me. Excuse no, me, excuse I think me. we've butchered the uh, tw- Celsius tw- to Fahrenheit. No, 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 no. It's times two plus 30. That's a fact. That's my okay, trick. Okay, so, sorry. I, I, I think I meant to say 25 Times two plus okay. three, that's 80. Okay, okay so Massachusetts has had the worst July, bar none, ever. Since Massachusetts became like a state, I think. We had more rain in the first 15 days of July than any July total in the history of the state. So if you try to tell me that global warming doesn't exist, you're the dumbest bastard out there because the weather everywhere is fucking nuts. Have you seen the floods in China? Did you yeah. see the video of these people on the fucking subway in China? Dude, they standing no. on this subway train, the water's up to their neck. And people are, I'm sure, drowning. It's awful over there. But there is something going on with weather where now it is warmer. The, the months, the, the seasons have changed, at least in the New England area. It's like now it's like September, October. It's like way warmer. It's just bizarre, bizarre weather. Yeah, it's, what's going on out there? It's, it's fucked up. I mean, global warming is such a simple concept. When you explain it, you could explain it like a two-year-old in a science class, and it, it makes all. And the people sense. don't believe it. Yeah, they don't. I mean, oh, it's cyclical. It's like, yeah, well, what fucking good is it? if it's cyclical? Every ten thousand years, it sucks when it's happening on your watch because well, like, the planet's suffering people, for it now. You know, people tend to say that, but they also didn't have the devices in order to measure it back then. So right. how do they know? Well, exactly. And there was no. I mean, there was no fucking industrial revolution fifteen thousand years ago. I mean, it's like everything. <laughs> Since then, is like we've just been kind of slowly. Like, the cavemen did have forks. All right, we did, hey, uh, we, did, we did dog a billionaire recently for giving like I think a billion dollars to climate to climate change, and we kind of gave him shit for it. I don't remember ten who billion. That was. It was what? Jeff Bezos who gave ten billion, and we kind of. So I mean, I think there was things he could have given the money. We we towards it matter a little that? bit more, but I right, we'll we'll dog him for something else after. But I got to start on Earth. I got to get this last read in cross country mortgage is much like us at Boston, a people first group of people. They are dedicated to the fundamentals of mortgage lending, which results in a fast, convenient and less stressful home financing or refinancing experience. Rates are unbelievably low right now. Don't pay the bank more money than you need to. And cross country mortgage makes the process as painless and simple as possible and helps you keep money in your pocket. So you can do fun things like take vacations to Columbia. If you're a homeowner and you haven't refied lately, you could be leaving thousands or even tens of thousands on the table. And that's money that could go toward a new finished basement or a trip to Vegas or a visit and biz out in LA. So call today for a fast, free, great quote in a free home valuation. 
Go to crosscountrymortgage.com slash Barstool to learn more about your future home buying future home buying experience or refinance your current mortgage. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, NMLS 3029, all loans subject to underwriting approval, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Back to Bezos. That rocket ship thing was such a fucking fraud. Like they touched like the end of the atmosphere and like crash landed to earth, not crash landed, but floated down to earth. That's a bit of a claim saying you went to space. I think like you touched, like you went where Chuck Yeager went fucking 60 years ago. And then you came back to earth. You went where RA goes every time he's on shrooms. Uh, Big cat, big (laughs) cat had the funniest line. Big cat had the funniest line. Cause you know how his rocket looked like a giant dick. Big big cat said he played just the tip with space. (laughs) That I missed that. Oh, that's fucking outstanding. His self awareness yeah. is not very good. I'll tell you honestly, I think the video of him laughing after mashed up with Dr. Evil doing the exact same laugh was one of the funniest videos I've ever watched on the internet. Have you seen that? No. His interview after, it's like, I don't even know what the question was. Did he answer? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he put the pinky up to his mouth and then the person mashed up Dr. Evil. I was like, it's legit him. Um, I wasn't as angry as people were very, very upset about this. Well, when, mean, he, when he thanked his employees and all the people who buy them, that's kind of like a slap in the face. Like people don't buy shit from Amazon to send like a billion in space for fucking seven seconds. He's like, oh, I want to thank all my employees who have to piss in bottles because the, they don't get long enough breaks and yeah. customers. Dude, I'm probably going to get an Amazon drone like incinerate my house tonight for saying all this yeah, shit. Yeah, we're toast. We're you know, we, we, hey, we were worried about Putin. We should be worried about fucking Bezos. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, it is uh, shut, it, it, he'll it, be shutting off our odd. cell phones. It's, he'll be shutting off def- our cell phones in no time here. Just like Putin. Yeah, the, Washington the, Post is a hit piece on He's trying to tuck one for, against Russia. <laughs> Why? Is Washington Post in, 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 in the bag for Amazon, all right? He, no, he owns, he owns the Washington Post. Oh, so, there you go. Yeah, there you go. I mean, Just one of his little toys. Hey, um, uh, what, what did you make of um, Dubas's comments, Whit? I kind of respected them a little bit. Um, yeah. And for anyone who doesn't know, Duba said he believes in this group. He believes this group will win a Stanley Cup. He he he, he trusts here. them. He loves them. He didn't say he loved them, but basically he is all in on this team in Toronto and truly believes that they will get it done. And you can dog them all you want. I mean, they haven't got out of the first round in fucking 20 years, but you got to look at – you look back and look back at the Washington Capitals – and when all those failures were happening, they stuck, they stuck together and they stuck as a group. And they, the, the GM there believed in that team and they ended up getting it done. And so you, in a sense of like quick panic and, and, and Toronto media and who knows what happens this year, if it's another first round exit, but I, I liked seeing it. I mean, what, what else are you going to say at this point? Like you've paid all these guys. Yeah. You need to find a goalie to work with, uh, Jack Campbell. So you got to figure that out. But Darcy Kemper. And it's yeah, that would be nice. A bit, but but and the, the asking price is apparently enormous. But I, I just like if you're a Leafs fan, I'd rather have him say that if they lose again first round. OK, talk to me again. But you got to you got to stick to your guns at some point. Like Agreed. Tampa with, I mean, you mentioned Washington. It's like people used to rip on Tampa all the time, too, for their playoff fairs. And yeah, I think back to back cups. I, I, yeah. Mind you, they were making trips to like the the, the semis, and exactly they lost in the Cup Finals. And they lost they Cup had Finals. Won, they had won one, one with Le Cavier and St. Louis. Yeah. So, but but I but I hear what you're saying, um, uh, Grinnell, like with that core group. So, well, I don't know. I don't really have much else noted. Down well, you're you're a Leaf. You're a Canadians fan now. No, I'm back on the Leafs. Back. Oh, okay, gotcha. Nice. Um, um, the one more reminder: uh, the Budweiser battle, of the grill between you two chuckleheads. I was the judge. Check that out on our YouTube channel if you haven't seen that yet. Uh, we have to reach out to Jeff D. Lowe because the Dozen Trivia Season Two has started up. We got to get our first game in. We got to get uh, game ready for the tournament when that starts. So, uh, get, yeah, blah, 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 blah. talk much. We'll tell Jeff D. Lowe. Make sure you get us on the show soon. Uh, any other stuff, boys? You want to save for next time? I know we've been running pretty. We've long ran here. way too long. Yeah. I yeah, tons that, of hockey talk this week. I think that makes some people very happy. I think it makes some people a little disappointed. I enjoy talking about everything, and I think that's clear, as we all do. But so much has been going on, like we mentioned. So we'll, next week we'll be able to really talk about all the free agent signings. That'll be Wednesday at noon. All the all the madness will begin. I'm very interested to see what goes on there with Seattle amongst other teams. Grinelli's telling me to check out my phone right now, so yep. I'll look there. Also, what did Grinelli say? Grinelli said to me, 
Street hockey, one more mention. August 6th and 7th, we're going to be in Detroit. Like we've said very, very often, you do not have to be playing in the street hockey tournament to come enjoy the festivities. We got beers, we got food, we got Pink Whitney, and more importantly, on Friday night the 6th, we have an absolute banger of a party at Shalahi's in Detroit. So I'm looking forward to seeing a bunch of Michiganers. Is that what they're called? Uh, They're able to just use their hand as a map of their state and i can't wait to watch ra play goalie because that could Ugh. be disgusting yeah i'm i'm i don't know i'm, I'm dread i'm not dreading it i'm just uh i'm kind of a little queasy thinking about it but i uh i'm playing in the we met golf tournament that's a local uh great amateur event in mass golf runs shout out to them for giving me the invitation have not played golf this year we'll be very interested to see the scores that the wit puts up um, played this weekend, shot 72 Saturday, 83 Sunday, Ugh. disgusting. So definitely some inconsistencies, but I just want to get back in the grind of tournament golf. I'm really looking forward to that. I'll be able to recap that. I know that'll make a bunch of you people disgusted and happy at the same time. I love being on the fence. You know what you want in life or in our industry? You want half the people to love you. You want half the people to hate you. I think that's right where I'm at with our fan base. So I look forward to playing some golf and being able to fill everyone in. And like we've said, we're going to be taking a few weeks off, but we have banger interviews coming. And I'm really looking forward to those dropping because you guys are going to enjoy them. Absolutely. we got a few shows we'll catch up on, too. I know we texted about them. We'll talk about them next week. And uh, also, what grinds my gears, Biz? I mean, we want to do some of those. i got a few of those written down, but we'll save them for next week when we'll probably need some shit. So, again, we'll see everybody in Detroit at Shillelagh's next week. Have a great week, and we'll catch up with you later. Ari's like, fucking people using the crosswalk button. Pricks. (laughs) All right, guys. Peace.